So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, tell me My name is Roman Hunter, well, I'm from London. And uh, I'm talking this morning about ontology based data access and integration. Uh, well, I see the core point that uh, I really want to be kind of a theorist of, of the top. So, uh, basically, my part will be rather theoretical. But if you don't understand anything, please stop me and ask whatever language you prefer. Right? And there are random problems there as well. And just one question. Yeah. The camera took the presentation during the time. Yeah, 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 well, I'll, I'll make it available later. Right? I mean, I was finishing it this morning, so that's why it's not available. As always. <coughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, those slides are not entirely mine, they being used by the panel. I borrow slides from other people, other people borrow from me, and so on. They, they keep it circling, and so on. So here is just a list of people. And I'm uh, particularly uh, grateful to Oriana, who provided a short demo that will be done later on, or shortly before lunch. Okay. So, uh, the thing is that with the information systems in general is that, uh, well, in recent years, well, data storage uh, well, has become considerably cheap and there's lots of data available and so on, and that data is stored usually in different data sources and there is a part need to integrate it all to get some new information, some useful information and so on. There's been examples like that, well, yes, they didn't care much of the school, but, well, yes, the Marcus mentioned uh, lots of data in uh, uh, well, bioinformatics and screens and so on, they have really huge databases with lots of information and uh, well, there is need to, to get a kind of more unified view of those different data sources. Well, so, there are many challenges to information systems now, well, for instance, well, the amount of data, well, the complexity of data, it's, it's not all relational, or kind of data, it's mostly hierarchical. So nowadays it's all not even structured, or semi-structured, not structured at all. So lots of just plain text data, something like the web, right? So it's just full of well, like data, but data has no structure there whatsoever, but from kind of references, kind of means. Uh, well, data is well, usually incomplete and inconsistent, so that makes it even more interesting. Uh, well, it's also distributed and so on. So this is all kind of standard things for kind of you understand the context. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. But anyway, uh, the, the thing is that well, the life has become very complicated and really needs to uh, be able to, to deal with lots of data, data in different sources. And this is what we kind of try to have a look at. Uh, well, there are different uh, sides to this problem. One side of this problem is kind of the traditional database uh, side to it, and several well, people in database have been working on it for quite some time. So, for instance, nowadays there are well, databases that support uh, storage of cell XML data, so you can access a tweet, the index, and so on, so this is going to fine. And then, well, data integration is a kind of separate area. Uh, it's been around actually for well, quite some time now, and there is lots of money involved in there. There is some research that says that basically, despite all the recession and so on, and all the you know, economic doom and gloom, life actually in data integration isn't, well, isn't that bad, so it's kind of well, or nearly 9% <coughs> uh, uh, growth each year. So, so that's kind of one of the recent forecasts there. So but that's kind of the traditional database uh, side, and there are quite a lot actually has been done there. So well, there are commercial systems that allow you to also have data stored on different sources, and that data is unified in some way and can query across different sites and so on. So but that's kind of database, and not from there, but kind of from, from the second uh, point of view. And that's a kind of slow knowledge representation reason. Right? And so uh, that area, well, what initially all kind of started as an area of artificial intelligence, now actually it's, oh, it's much modern. And there, uh, there is lots of research 
research there, but that research is called quite often uh, is uh, in different, well, either use different terms or, or different motivations, so on and so on. Uh, well, we have plenty of results there, but those results need to be adapted to well, databases and information systems in general. So, uh, what, what, what do we know about data integration in general? Right? So, there are several approaches. <coughs> one, one of the approaches actually is called centralized data integration. And that thing actually is quite simple. So, what you have there, you have a number of data sources that store data. Those are kind of local data sources. Uh, and then there is a global schema that unifies them. Well, that, that is called the centralized system. Right? So, and that global schema. In some way, just relates all those sources and so on. And what actually the user sees, the user sees only the global scheme. The user is not interested in how it's all organized in terms of local stores, whether it's all, I don't know, in Europe, in the States, or wherever. It doesn't really matter where those sources are. <coughs> what the user sees is the global scheme, and the user is able to query the global, the global scheme. All right? And so. Uh, and the keyword there will one the keyword there will unify it and conspire with you. Well, unify it means that all those data sources are unified in the global schema. And transparent that all the user data actually have to bother themselves with uh, the details of how to organize what's actually important is the global scheme and so on. Well, have some this is all kind of all product uh, might sound product idealist. This is what one of the ways. Uh one of the extremes. Another uh, way of doing data integration there is actually, well, you see the problem here is that uh, with this kind of central approach, so you call it kind of global scheme stored somewhere and all the queries go through, through there, and then, uh, well, the system decides which parts of the query were executed, how the results are merged and so on, right? Uh, uh, to make this kind of uh, thing more fast and more efficient, well, it may make sense to just take all the information from the data source and uh, or instead of having just virtual global schema, just materialize what is called materialization. To materialize the whole thing in terms of the big, huge central database that will store all, all, the, all the data. And actually this is, uh, well, this tends to be well, quite a popular approach. Well, lots of systems actually, well, lots of practical systems actually work on that, lots of banks and so on. They might have their own individual databases right in different sites. And then there's one single or huge database that well, runs somewhere. And so all the updates are uh, they are they also transfer to the central database. The central, central database contains kind of snapshots and last data, sorry. And then uh, those well kind of global and central database, they, uh, they tend also to be kind of optimized for well, some different kind of processes. So, well, if you know these notions, uh, oil, TV, other free well, online transaction processing, and all that, also, those are two different well, extremes of life. So, if you take, take also talking about uh, uh, online transaction processing systems, that so those must support very quick updates. Well, something like well, every bank, and then uh, all the transactions that come from bank, well, they, they have to be committed quick, right? So they, they have to be processed very quick. But then, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, well, this is all kind of big, well, every second activity, really. And then, uh, but this is not the whole picture of the model of banks actually, right? And they also run uh, other things that, so that are responsible for more kind of strategic planning and so on. And they need kind of aggregate information and so on. And that's why all the transactions from the shops, for instance, all the transactions from the shops, they go to the central database and there they call a group to analyze and so on. For instance, what well, a supermarket might, might be interested in kind of in the trends, and what products are sold at which rates, and uh, what probably is fine for correlation between different products and so on. So there's lots of stuff going on. And well, in that case, what we clearly have also prices in the capital supermarket. Uh, supermarkets then well at the beginning so the supermarkets might actually run their own local database but then all the information is well aggregated summarized and so on and then it's all of course the central database where it can be analyzed quickly. Those are quite different types of databases but still it's kind of a data integration scenario. And there is another term which is uh, well, related to this is called, called data exchange. And data exchange for data is also the same kind of source database 
and you've got the Zeiger database, and then you transfer the data from the source database to the Zeiger database, for whatever reasons, for instance, for abbreviation and so on. Um, uh, now the kind of a third approach, so data integration, and that one is uh, well, called peer-to-peer -peer data integration. And well, this is kind of the most flexible scenario, the most obviously desirable, but this is one of the most difficult things to do. So what you have here, you probably have a number of peers, and each of those uh, has well, some local data sources, and their own peer schemes, and those peer schemes are connected in some way or another. So it all kind of is supposed to run quickly, smoothly and so on, actually it's pretty double across the graph. But this is again basically uh, uh, what the industry actually would like to see, but I don't think this is the most realistic one. Alright, any questions? Everything is clear? Anyway, so <coughs> I've got a kind of ideas for the piece of terminology in uh, data integration. So here is uh, just a simple example of what we have, right? So well, suppose we well, have two databases that store uh, some information about stuff of moons. So the first database there, you know, just single relations, the like relations in maps in database tables. So the first relation there stores information about uh, Movies shot by European directors and it's only kind of recent ones since 1960s. Right? And the second database contains uh, uh, some reviews. And that one actually contains reviews on the recent movies, like on the 1990s. Easy to explain. There was no legend, there was no internet before 1990s, so no one actually bothered to store those reviews. So, but those two data sources, they're kind of local data sources, right? So they're just independent and without kind of unified view, they work by, by, by themselves, but we want to integrate. And what we do, we create a global schema, and in that global schema, we have three relations. So, one relation is just this sort of movies with the director sending in here, that they were released in. Then there is another table, another relation there that has all the views. And then we also have a separate relation there for well, storing all the European directors. And what uh, we actually want to see, well, we want, we want to ask queries, right? So we want to post queries to the system. And well, queries are that kind of, well, for instance, get me all the titles and reviews of movies from 1998. Uh, and uh, well, here I use some different syntaxes for expressing more or less the same idea. I wasn't sure which one you would be most comfortable with. So this is kind of really plain English, so that can, I suppose you can read it. Right? So this bit here is SQL. Right? You're familiar with that? Good. Well, good. Then, then, well, then was the right choice. Right? But, but this is not, not the most natural choice for me, obviously. Uh, well, I come from a different area. So this is SQL, right? And here's what well, precisely the same statement expressed in well, data. Have you heard of it? Not really, but well, this is kind of uh, this kind of this, the same thing. Well, it's kind of really first order logic expression, blah blah blah. But the point here is, well, it's, it's quite easy to read. So what, what we have here, well, in this SQL query, you have two tables, move and review, right? And so on. Uh, then we have some conditions on uh, attributes of those relations on the columns of the table, right? And here we express well more or less the same. We use this name for this table here that's called the predicate. And here are the arguments. So well, T, we just don't know. We just we range in those T's, right? And then well, 1998 is just a constant, so that has to match, right? So, <coughs> And then, then D, then at the end, is again a certain range. So if you well, think of it as a kind of, well, this table move, it has three columns, right? So it's kind of set of three groups. Not only a triple, but still three balls, right? And this is just a term in predicate that has three arguments. We just fix one of the arguments and say that, well, get, get, get us all the pairs of the other two arguments. And then here's another. Uh, 
binary predicate this time, this is again predicate name, so which just coincides with this table name here. And uh, we say that, well, the first argument of that predicate must match the first argument of that predicate. And this is precisely what actually is expressed here in SQL, right, with this quality here. And then this R is, well, it doesn't appear here, uh, but it, it does appear in what this is called the catalyst query. So the, by instinct T, T's and R's, we just can all the titles and reuse, right? And the T's we take from the first argument to move it, which is, well, just coincides with the first argument of review, and the R's is just the second argument of the review. And we just completely forget about the D. Well, Marcus mentioned yesterday mentioned this term projection, fancy term, but this is what actually what happens. This is, this is a classical of select project joint query in SQL. Because while you select, uh, you project away some arguments, so you, I mean, without projection, that would be just start in SQL. So just take us all the arguments. But here we do the projection, we just oh, forget about some of the arguments. And so select project join, and well, here's the join. And this needs to be called well, proper selection. So it's possible. Um, so, how, how this can be done well, in principle? Let's, let's just have a different options, right? So there is a, actually quite an important component which I haven't <laughs> uh, mentioned yet. So we have this global schema and we have our data sources. But somehow we have to relate our data sources to the global schema, right? And well, those relations are called methods. Let us just, just have a look at what those methods actually can be. Well, the kind of really first remark is that, well, this, this again just a technical term, but uh, this is uh, just to put you in kind of in each. So, we're concerned here with what's called sound names. Uh, uh, well, the, it's quite difficult to explain where this term sound comes from, but anyway, so it has nothing to do with kind of vibrations in the air. It's, uh, <laughs> it's called this solidity of the argument, I think. Uh, anyway, so that literally means that uh, uh, the data in the uh, global scheme, well, the global data, uh, it all comes from data sources. It doesn't appear out of the nowhere. Right? So it all has to come from data sources. And only then it can appear in the global scheme. Uh, and so there are three types of, uh, or three well, large classes of methods, there are many more, well, there are actually many three. Right? So, well, the first one is uh, called uh, LED, uh, it's called, well, there are different synonymous notions there, either source centric or localized views, and uh, so on. There are different notions there. I'll explain this all in detail here, just to this and give you guidance for the future. So, this, well, this is source centric. This is uh, global schema centric, or kind of global schema centric. It's kind of very logical to have one. Must have that. And then there is actually all possible combinations of the two, but again, from the, well, you'll see that actually uh, the, the first one is difficult, the second one is easy, and those combinations actually they are even more difficult for all the practical purposes. But, well, they, can, they, they might be most useful, yeah. still, like the theory says that they are uh, very difficult to implement in practice. Well, here's another problem. I'll try to keep the number of problems to the minimum, but Oh, you, sorry, you have to, to, to have written them in some way or another. Uh, so, what <clears throat> uh, it says that in this uh, uh, global S views, right? So, what we're trying to say here is that all the terms, all the relations in the global scheme are defined in terms of views, in terms of relations in the local scheme. So, how do we do that? Well, we just write a bunch of, if you like, queries. Like SQL queries, this is a mathematical notation depending on SQL queries. So this said uh, that well, for all for all x, well x actually is different, but it doesn't really matter. But anyway, so for uh, <coughs> I take a relation in the global scheme here is with little g, right? and we say that uh, all the tuples in that relation, all the rows in that relation, they come as a result of a like, query. Well, this formula here, while well, I write it, this is from query, right? This means Five. Actually, it's a group. You can think of it as an SQL group. Right? And, uh, well, this, this is just, well, the second 
formula here, it just literally says that some of the triples in the uh, normal scheme they actually come from that. Suppose I don't really have to go into the details of the notation, but anyway. So the, the point is that uh, uh, here we have a kind of very straightforward, very direct representation of what uh, data is kind of stored. I mean, it's not necessarily stored, but still, what data is present in the global data. Right? So, well, we just have a direct query. So if you want to know which rows a certain relation in global scheme contains, you just execute that query and that's it. Right? And that's very kind of, kind of an in the Right, and this is uh, global as view. Right, and so here is a kind of example, just going back to, to the same uh, movies, the same directors, and so on. Well, the same global scheme of three relations. Uh, and here are the methods. So you remember that we had those relations. Well, I suppose that that actually is done on purpose. So they call R1 and R2 without any kind of connotation. So they just have So but what, what, what happens here is that when we specify those uh, three methods, we say that. Well, we take all our movies from that relation R1. And then, well, we keep the arguments the same. So essentially, that relation movies in a normal schema, it just coincides with relation R1. Then, well, we had another relation uh, that stored European directors. And that one actually, well, this is default director. Uh, and that actually also comes from this relation R1. But what we do, we just well, essentially take projection. We just forget about the titles of the films and the years they were released in, and we just take directors' names. So, well, to get all the European directors, we know that, well, relation R1, it has all the European directors, and well, that's, and we have no directors mentioned in our local data anywhere else. So that's the only way to get all the European directors. And then and we use that just taking straight from relation R2. Remember that public relation are so stored all the reviews for the movie. So let's see. Yeah. So well, the kind of the crucial bit that explains why actually this approach uh, is easy and uh, why actually it's uh, easy to implement. I mean, uh, it has certain disadvantages, but anyway. So I suppose I have given this query. Now we've seen this query before. So it gave me all the titles and all the reviews for all the movies since, well, it's not since, actually in 1990. So, uh, so this is precisely the same query that we had before that. We run the desk of query in this one. So now, so, well, we have this query that well, kind of the user comes and just types in the query. Right? So what does the system do? Well, the system actually does a very clever thing. It just looks at it as this movie, right, movie. Well, we have a definition for movie here, so it's just this query. So what we do, we just substitute this query straight there. Well, adjust the arguments, obviously. Huh? So this bit here is replaced by this bit there. Huh? Well, simply because of this definition there. Because of that method. <laughs> and now the second, our, well, the second part of this query is review. Right there. And then again, <coughs> simply because this is a relation in global scheme, and if we have a definition for that relation there, we can just again plug it in there, <coughs> and here's the result. And now, our system feels very lucky because it can just run this query on the total data store and get the answer. Kind of the complete topic. So, what, 
poate că le-am spus că nu e nimic. We say the following. We take the relation in the in the source data, the local data, and then say that well, every tuple there it gives us well, every row there gives us some thing in terms of the global state. Again, this is this file here is just a query. And the thing is that, well, it's, uh, well, it just expresses uh, all the information in, in the global, uh, in the uh, local data source in terms of kind of queries in the global. And the problem here is that, uh, well, we don't actually have a single recipe here how so compute relations in the global scheme. And in fact, well, some form of reasoning actually is required to answer queries there. We'll give an example there. And this is again just the justification why it's called actually this local as used. And here's again well, this whole example of uh, movies and European directors and so on. And now, what we do here, uh, we need to specify uh, uh, our methods. And what we do here, we just say that, uh, well, uh, this relation R1, if you remember, it contains uh, all the films uh, released by, well, since 1960 and shot by European directors. So what we do here, we just express precisely that. We just say that, well, relation R1 contains all those movies. Remember that this is the relation from the global data scheme. So all the films of the movies shot by European directors since 1960. And the second relation, the second relation in the source, the source scheme, the source database, uh, it lists all the reviews for films or movies shot since 1990. So again, we say that well, that relation contains all the movies uh, and their reviews that uh, were released and shot since 1990. Now, going back to precisely the same query that we had before, that example query. Uh, well, if you look at it, there is no direct way, I mean, there is no obvious way how you can transform that query, that given query, that user query, into something that can be executed on the local data sources. Well, this time I don't really see. Well, again, here's the answer, obviously. But then there is no direct way. So, you can just plug those movie and review in there. I mean, there, there is no way in that. We have no expressions from it, we have no queries. So what, what we need to do, we need to somehow to invert those definition samples to redefine them that way, just to, to be able to express them particularly. But this one actually, well, well, I like well, this is quite simple. So well, what, I mean, if you look at this, we are just asking for all the reviews for the movies shot since 1998, and then, well, again, this, this bit here just doesn't jump. But, that, that bit we, well, we just like, we just guessed it, actually. Uh, can formally prove it, but that's not the point. The point is that there is no very simple and non-transparent way of transforming this query into the end result. Once we, once we have that end result, well, we actually can plug the bits in there. Well, that, that's kind of way of, like, of showing that this is indeed the, the query way after. So we can plug those bits, but well, simplify them slightly and so on. And that, that will give us this query. But that's kind of really the inverse process, which is very tricky. So we have two different views. We have well, global views and global views. They, are, they have uh, certain advantages and certain disadvantages. Well, here is just an example of some systems they are basically involved. They're not really industrial systems, they are more kind of university prototypes, but they still involve it. But I really think here that they actually exist for people who are to implement all this stuff. So it's, they even should uh, kind of demonstrate to certain people that actually all works. So <coughs> there are some well, 
it's a vicious skill. Well, first of all, uh, as I said, that the main advantage of our global view is that actually it's very easy to implement by unfolding. And unfolding is the keyword that's trying to just plug all the definitions in there. Right? But then I guess, well, as always in life, you have trade disadvantages for certain disadvantages. And disadvantages are like this. So basically, uh, whenever you add some new data source, you have to redefine the global scheme, you have to redefine the methods. Uh, that can be quite a tedious and uh, error-prone process. Because the, well, the whole thing, thing with, the, with those methods, that, well, those ones that, that, that I just shown you, they are very simple ones. They just have free land relations and so on, not very much. But people in practice actually, they, they deal with, I mean, you can take any well, industrial scale database, and that, that will contain well, thousands of tables, hundreds of tables. And then there will be actually thousands of mappings, also map each table to, to another and so on. And those actually, I mean, will see because of the sheer number of uh, uh, tables and relations involved there, uh, it's very easy to make a mistake and so on. And then again, quite often, there is no single person who knows how this whole thing actually works. And it all depends on documentation or care and so on. But again, the, the problem is that since there is uh, no single person that is able to see the whole thing in general, no, no one actually can tell whether the mechanics are correct or not. And that's the, well, the particular art of, of doing it. And that's, that's why actually this is quite a serious uh, uh, drawback here in this global abuse approach. Is that basically every time you plug in a new data source for one reason or another, you have to reconsider all the mechanics. And uh, <coughs> on the other hand, well, this local as you, as you might imagine, actually, well, all the disadvantages turn into advantages and that way around. So it's very easy, well, it's very modular local as you, because, well, we have this global schema, which is kind of an idealistic view of the system of the world, as the way Dr. Parker suggested, <coughs> discouraged us from modeling the, the real life. Uh, but anyway, so. The whole point is that uh, uh, it's quite modular because if you need to plug in your data sources, you just plug them in. You can just define that in terms of global scheme, and that's very relatively easy. You don't have to consider the whole thing. But then, in very gross sense, actually, it's quite tricky. So you can't get away with just enforcing, you have to do a certain form of reasoning. And uh, <coughs> it's actually quite interesting because, well, for us, the, the word reasoning well, usually is just sitting here, right? I mean, for him, reasoning is the, the problem to solve. Well, in, and quite a lot of actually industrial application of reasoning is kind of uh, is prohibitively uh, expensive, so you can't actually do reasoning on the fly. So, well, you can't obviously imagine any. Well, the Mars Rover, I mean, this curiosity thing, which is now somewhere on Mars, right? You can't actually imagine that thing doing any kind of reasoning. No, we'll never we'll, we'll have a chance to get the result of that. But anyway, so, uh, now, but that was all about kind of uh, data integration in the kind of classical sense and sense of data. So now, uh, now we come to the, to the ontologies in the semantic vertical anyway, and so we have to deal with, we have to deal with the ontologies. So now, the question is, what can ontologies do for us? And they kind of, if you look at yet another definition of what an ontology is, ontology is a form of conceptualization of the domain of features. Lots of rubbish. No, but anyway, so, well, the idea of well, the kind of ontology is right again, well, Marcus discouraged yesterday from this, but then, so the idea of ontology is that they describe the world as it is. But, well, you have to be very careful, they are not just in full generality, but for a very concrete purpose. Right? And that's actually very important. That's why all those profiles in our two are important because, uh, well, if you, if you want to describe a rule, if you have to provide a well, certain description, well, you have to always to keep in mind for, for the purpose of that description. So, whether you want to be just to describe it as fully and then you don't really care about the consequences, so I actually you want to, to get all the consequences very quickly, very efficiently. Maybe you're interested in consequences on the certain form and so on. There will be actually a lot, a lot of those little things later. So, <coughs> now, uh, that idea, uh, uh, well, actually, but that idea is not that long. Well, it's 
not that old. I think that it is kind of um, 10 or 15 years old. So, now, uh, what about if we uh, just describe our global scheme? What do we think of our global scheme as an ontology? I mean, we, we see that for the role of global scheme, it just unifies all the data sources, right? But then, the point is that, well, if you look at kind of well, proper database schemas, they contain lots of details, for example, like primary keys, foreign keys, indexes, and so on. Is it really relevant in the global scheme? Mm. Well, not really. Yeah. Well, so the ones that, well, on the other hand, ontologists, they kind of, they, well, recently, they, they have become as kind of really as the language, if you like, of uh, representing the world, kind of modeling language. So if you want to describe something about well, you just data station ontology. Well, at least there are tools available that people understand them more or less well and so on. Well, quite often those ontologies are quite simple, they have really kind of taxonomies and so on, so it makes life really easy, right? So, well, that's the, the whole idea of what I was talking later on. So, but we look here, we have different data sources and we have a global schema, and well, the global schema in this case is just an ontology. And well, obviously we have some methods. And so uh, here are just uh, again uh, notions, well, terms rather, that I'll be using in the change. And so uh, here are, well, there are some interesting bits and pieces. Uh, so uh, this ontology here on the top, well, I call it ontology. Mm. If you think about it carefully, then this ontology actually it has no references to, well, quite often it has no references to individuals. So, there, so it's only the terminology, terminological part of the ontology, it's only the T-box. So when I mention ontology, I really mean the T-box of that ontology. Right? Because the T-box, the data actually, is stored here in data source. But we're really speaking about well, huge data, well, huge A boxes containing, I don't know, millions, trillions, or whatever. And right. no reason it would be able to deal with them. Well, simply because they, they're very likely to fit into memory. And it feels like so, and well, this is the whole idea, it's just, well, that, that's one view of the, all these pictures. So basically, you can think of this as a global scheme and that then data stored in, in the database and this kind of data integration scenario. You can think of this scenario, well, somewhat different. Eh? You can think of it as a well, having a huge A box and a T box somewhere there, and then well, simply all the data is stored in the database, and then we just split well, the ontology. So that's ontology and T box is the same. Well, conceptual structure of the domain is just meant to say that well, this is kind of global scheme. Well, there is another term which is quite quite often used in kind of logic. It's called intention level. This is, well, the data here, data sources, they are for the extensional level of the system. They kind of define the extent of the system. And that's kind of the intent of the system. It's slightly philosophical terminology, but anyway. So once again, this is the T-box of the ontology, and this is the A-box of the data. That will be uh, for the rest of this session. Um, right. And obviously there are mappings in between. And an important bit here is that uh, we want this uh, scenario to run as smoothly, as efficient as possible. And that's why the mappings here, they are understood as global as view mappings. Because, well, as I tried to show you, that local as view actually brings all the complications. And here's once again, well, pretty much the same picture, some different words. So what we have here, we have global as view mappings, we have data sources that sort of the, the A box, we have an ontology of the T box, terminology is here, and so I want to achieve this logical transparency. So the, the user just drops queries on the system and the queries knows how to deal with it. And it's kind of really as an illustration of this all this this all meant to be kind of really a sort of example of things to come. Uh, just imagine we have this ontology and all this notation, I don't know. Does it look like RDF scheme? Yeah. Well, I tried to make it look like RDF scheme. Well, easily to be fair. Anyway. So, what, 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 what we have here actually, we have uh, three pluses, right? 
have lectures, academic stuff, and modules. Those are three classes. Uh, and vocabulary, uh, whatever, yeah, or, or learning critical relation, uh, issues. And so what, what we know is that well, those two classes, lecture and academic stuff, they are connected by the subclass rules. Which if you remember means that every lecture is an academic stuff. Take a lecture on it. It has to be an academic stuff. And then the relation is that uh, the domain is academic stuff and its range is more. The main and range, you all familiar with it, right? So that's the first argument and the second argument of the boundary relation. And, well, for instance, uh, just imagine why I'm interested in the, we want to get a list of all academic stuff members. How do we do it? I mean, here we have data sources, this, this data source stores this by the relation, and the data source has this relation. So, how do we get all the academic stuff members? <coughs> yeah, well, well, one way of getting academic staff members is from this class of lectures. So every lecture is an academic staff member. Yes. So if we take all the lectures from that data source, then we'll get some academic staff members, mm -hmm. but not necessarily all. And after that, we get all, all right. those four teachers' uh, models. Yeah, absolutely right. So basically, the second way of getting academic staff members is to take this relation teachers. Take the projection of that relation to the first argument. Projection. I mean, take the domain of that relation. Right? And that will give you, well, possibly a different set of academic stuff, right? probably the same, I mean, you'll never know. But the whole point is that if you have no academic stuff members, then you have to follow both ways. Right? Because there might be an academic stuff member who is not next to all the professor. But the professor might teach something. But decide not academic. It depends on the how true the pattern is. Anyway, right, so that's the kind of the idea. And that's, uh, well, if you understand this example, then all well, the rest of this will be well, just technical and boring. Okay. Right. Now, <laughs> once again, serious stuff. Uh, when we look at this scenario, uh, we, want to, well, we want to get something, right? And, uh, once, well, first of all, we want to really get the right balance of uh, the uh, expressivity of the ontologic language, of what we can say in this approach. Well, obviously, well, taking the whole model to something else would be very desirable, but well, theory actually says that it's not possible. It's, it's nowhere near our So that's why well, Marcus yesterday told me about this our SUPL. And actually, our SUPL was created as a kind of reply to that. Right, and uh, <coughs> so once you get the right expressive power of the ontological language on that end, okay, we have to keep the complexity of quite low so to make the system efficient. Uh, <coughs> that's one thing. Uh, choosing the right ontological language, well, obviously, was. in certain way, choice, uh, well, choice has been done, but that might not be the final choice. Uh, the second bit here is actually what is the query language? Again, well, quite obviously, once you well, once you use the full SQL, for instance. But then it turns out that SQL has some features that uh, don't actually fit really well into the picture. Uh, those features are not used very often, but anyways. Uh, so, uh, the third item there is how to connect uh, ontologies and so on. Well, here's kind of the question, well, the answer is here more or less clear, so global as we use is kind of the only sensible way there. You know, Really right. And then, well, the last one is very practical. Is uh, are there any tools? And as, I, as I announced before, I'll try to show you one of those. It's, well, it's still kind of a university thing, but it works. Right. An entity relation should be there. Are you familiar with those? They're kind of the the claim is that they're standardly used in uh, database design, uh, although uh, they are quite convenient to uh, illustrate certain bits in this one, but uh, well, on a large scale, lots of pictures <coughs> might be. It just depends. So, what we have here, uh, we have uh, three relations. We have uh, managers. 
uh, well, three tables in terms of data. We have managers in place and projects. And uh, we have a binary relation between employees and projects. So those three are entities. This is a relationship. And then the entities uh, have attributes. Well, for instance, project has an idea and a title. And the play has an idea and a name. And well, to make it even more, the database like, well, this idea actually is the key. Right? So it uniquely defines the values of all other. Or primary key in database itself. So that's what we say. And here is another bit which is, uh, <coughs> which brings us, well, some close to knowledge, is that uh, uh, some people call it easy relation, ease a relation. So this means that again, every manager is an employee. This is what like sub relations relation RDF schemes. Uh, well, I suppose I should put some kind of error on it. Right? I mean, the direction is somewhat unclear because it just looks what is it? My, my fault. Uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> well, not every place you manage it, but that's kind of common sense stuff, right? Uh, but anyway, so what we can do, we can. Uh, so that's the graph connotation for data. And then uh, some people in theory, well, again, well, some logicians as well, they have come up with a much more general thing, which they call dependencies. And well, dependencies actually, they, they all uh, were invented essentially in the early 80s. And they, they were kind of really an attempt to generalize the notion of foreign keys, primary keys, and so on. So if you're familiar with the notion of foreign key, then those double generation dependencies are precisely from the dog. I mean, they are, well, double generation dependencies are kind of a generalization of uh, foreign key. Well, foreign key says that well, every value from one table must appear in another table. Right? That's the meaning of foreign key. So if you have a binary relation, then, well, for instance, here, uh, you have this works for. Well, in the database, you would model this as a kind of table with two columns. And it only makes sense to say that, well, the first column, well, values from the first column, they must appear there. There might be IDs of employees. And uh, values from the second column, they, they must be IDs of projects. Otherwise, I mean, if you have just arbitrary values that. That's not actually the correct model. And well, these first for the formulas, once again, just for the formulas, sorry guys, uh, they just, they meant to express precisely that. Uh, the first one there said that uh, for all x, if there is a y that, that appears in that relation works for with x, then there is a z that is related to X and an employee. So think of this X as being ID. Right? For every ID of, well, for every employee, uh, if uh, the employee works for some project, then, well, that employee has a name. Well, there is a Z name for that employee. And similarly, we can express it for the project. And the last one here is a little bit funny. It says that every manager is an employee, but we know that manager and employee, well, they both, those entities have two attributes, and that's why we say that for all IDs, for all names, if uh, name is a name for that employee with that particular ID, that the same actually is true of all right. Sorry, if, if it's the case for manager, then it's the case for an employee. Essentially, one relation is a subset of that. Uh, so basically the first two formulas they just express that those that, that relation sits between those two entities and the last one the last formula here just describes this is a relation and that's subclass relation. And they call double generated dependencies well because they generate doubles. In what sense you might ask, well, you see those existential quantifiers here on the right hand side. So you can read this, well, this 
Well, if you look at the set of implication, like a subset of here. So basically, if something is true here, then, well, the right hand side must also be true. So then, so, well, you should read actually that implication as a kind of really trigger effect. So that's not really a logical implication. That's something like, if there is a rope in that table, then there must be a rope in that table. And the point is that we don't actually know this value of Z. We don't actually know the name of that employee, just know his ID. But in a way, uh, I'm trying to explain why actually it's called tuple generating. Right? So in a way, if there is a tuple, well, tuple is just a row in the table. Mathematical notion. Right? So if there is a tuple there, then there must be a corresponding tuple there. So if there is no such tuple, we must generate it in a way. We don't actually do that in databases. In databases, all the transactions will simply not be able to commit if you have such a constraint. Yes, question. Um, if you have a property, if measure as property project and uh, as project it will, it will be an in individual of uh, some projects. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, uh, but just try to stick to this picture. Right? So in this picture what happens is that well, project has two attributes. So that, that's why we model it as a binary relation. Well, from kind of from the ontological point of view, that sounds as an utter nonsense. No, because an employee is clearly calls it a class. Right? Yes. Well, but in databases, it's all somewhat different. That's my point here. But how would you change it? Uh, well, the, well, in ontology, that would be a concept. And then, well, each individual there will have its own ID anyway. Right? So that's the URI that is associated to that individual anyway. And then that uh, well, title for the project will be just the well, one aspect, there will be a relation, a role in description of whatever, or attribute or whatever. Again, what's called the uh, data type property with the type string. Right? So you, your model is somewhat different. The point is that well, this is kind of still a database picture. I'm still trying to give you a little bit of databases, the database theory is that. Yeah. But, but, but the point is that, as I say, if you model this in a database, then you will model all project in a place, you will model that as a kind of table with two columns anyway. You'll have an ID there, you have a name, or you'll, you might have some other whatever. But still that, that those will be just relational tables. In our view, if you model it different, because you have only three points. Well, those are just some different approaches. I'll kind of switch back to kind of ontological thing very shortly, don't worry. Uh, so, once again, those are kind of, they're called double generated dependencies, and I will really use those words many times. Uh, then there's another thing which is kind of generalization, generalization of uh, keys or primary keys. Primary keys says that a table, well, in a table, if you have a primary key, the primary key uniquely defines the value of the other thing. Something like uh, uh, so each person has a unique, or each employee has a unique ID, it's, it's number, right? And that number uniquely defines well, the name of the employee, the, I don't know, the department that the employee is in, and so on, everything else. And here, here is again a kind of thing, but an attempt to express the whole thing in kind of first order formulas. And what we have here, well, we have here some employees with the same ID, right? but with different names. And if this happens, then actually Z1 must be the same as Z2. So this means that if you have two employees with the same ID, well, then their names must be the same, just the same employees. And these guys, well, they can be database on well, the simplest way they're called keys, uh, then there was a kind of Another thing which was called functional dependencies, and then kind of if you generalize it further, then they call quality generating dependencies. Okay. Generate this quality. Uh, I will not talk much about those guys. Now, <coughs> well, still a bit more database for you, uh, because uh, we'll see that there are some 
very serious conference with uh, the ontologist and what, what actually happens there. And uh, that actually, well, kind of instant understanding of what means judging those subtle differences is quite often, uh, quite often leads to errors in modeling. So, well, in that way, uh, well, the, what happens is that logicians call the globe wall assumption. This literally means what is said is true, everything else is false. And here is an example. Uh, well, here we just kind of drift off from databases and go back to kind of the really usual ontology things. So we have employee here is just a set of objects, right? So as you would have in our well, in description which grammar. Right? So and that set contains three individuals, John, Mary, and me. Those are three employees. Two of those employees actually are managers, John and me. Because discrimination, right? but anyway, that's not my example. Uh, then there are two projects there, A and B, right? And this relation works for contains two pairs. John works for project works for project A, Mary works for project B. Right? And now the query, the query is give me all the employees. Well, that's a typical database thing, right? You just go to that particular relation and retrieve what? What's that? Yeah, the three of those guys, John, Mary, and Nick, all three of them, right? They're all in place. Why? Well, because it's just written there. Who else can be in play? No one else, because it's not written there. So that's the meaning of the closed wall assumption. What is there is there. What is not is not. Life is easy. Right? So, and for instance, well, <coughs> uh, going, well, slightly going back to those uh, integrity constraints of dependencies, double generated dependencies. Just imagine for a second that Nick is not listed in there in employees. What if they allowed in the database? Well, if you have this relation between managers and employees so that every manager is an employee. Well, if you try to do that in the database, well, the database will tell you, no, 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 no. we can't go. For one simple reason, because for well, a database, if Nick is not there, then he's not there. And then this integrity constraint that every manager is an employee will be obviously violated. Well, the database will just say that, well, you can have Nick as a manager. He's not an employee, so you have to employ him first and then make a promotion. So you imagine he gets a promotion. So that's well, data right? kind of logical foundation of data is very general information. Uh, so now going to query languages. So well, we kind of know what SQL is, and so uh, well, for logicians, SQL is called well, graph all of SQL is called the main independent first order queries. Yeah. I'm not going to explain a bit about the main independence, that's rather tricky. I'm going to explain a bit about first order queries. So we as you have noticed that well I've used quite a lot of first order logic sequence for that. So and then in our queries can use database predicates. Uh, they can use well, logical connectors called well, disjunction, conjunction, and negation. You well, can think of this as union, intersection, and complement. And we can also use quantifiers. Well, that is essential quantifiers we've seen a lot, and that's very natural from the point of view of SQL. But actually, well, SQL also has a kind of universal quantifier. If you've ever written something like, uh, well, a tuple is not in a relation. Well, that's the complement. And the, I'm sure you've seen it before that the complement of the universal quantifier is the existential quantifier. Okay. Have you seen this? I mean, that, 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 that's one of the. No, you want us to show it. Uh, so if you have something like not for all RC, this is the same as. Yeah, exists are not. Yeah. So but that's the kind. Of, that, that is how kind of the universal quantifier logic is called is due to the existential quantifier. Right, so if you have one and you have negation, then what we have done. That. And then SQL actually can use a kind of restricted form of universal quantification. And restricted again one because of that little bit is called domain independence. 
That's, that's not precisely the point here. The point is, well, how you define uh, what is an answer to a query in the database. And uh, <coughs> the magic uh, well, the magical combination here is for closed world assumption. So basically what you do, you just take all the data, everything that's written there, you remember the peak, join, whatever, and you form what's called an well, first order interpretation. Once again, this is logic, blah, 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 blah. It's not the point. Well, in this interpretation, what we have? Only what is written there in, the, in our data. Or in the data also. Nothing else. There are, there are no inferences here whatsoever. What's written is true. What's not written is false. Right? And that example is an answer to a query. Well, if and only, you've seen this before, if and only, right? So that's not a bad That's if and only. Right? And so, uh, <coughs> that query is true in that interpretation. For instance, in the previous slide, we have uh, Nick belongs to the interpretation of this concept of lady, and that's why Nick is an answer to this query. Right. Now, <coughs> as I said, um, there are some special cases of uh, escrow queries which are kind of particularly loved by logicians. Well, one of those is which is called Select Project Join. Those are in logic that all can jump to the Why? Because, well, they use all the data with predicates. Conjunction, which is quite often just replaced by a problem. If you have no choice between conjunction and disjunction, the problem means and. And existential quantification. And the existential quantifiers then, they are, um, they are just not written that at all because Yes, because you have just one sort of quantifier. And the whole point is that why actually, uh, well, justification why those conjectures, why they are particular favorites with logicians, well, kind of practical justification on that is that uh, well, database engines are particularly well suited for those queries. Why? Well, um, well, here's again the point, right? Um, going back to kind of school. So we have, suppose, an array of elements, right? long list of elements. If you want to check that, well, say, 42 is there, what do you do? Oh, just a particular element 42. You want to check whether that element is there in the list, in the long list. Millions of elements. Um, um, yeah, no, no, you should just go through all of them, right? And that's what's called linear search. I can just go through all the elements, and that's, oh, that's very slow, right? Now, what if you know that that, actually, that sequence actually is sorted? What do you do? Well, you do binary search. You just cut it in half, see whether that, that half is greater than, greater or smaller than 42. If that half actually is greater than 42, you go left, cut it again in half, see. So that's binary search. So linear search takes roughly as many Elements. I mean, in the, worst, in the worst case, actually, you have to go through all of them. Binary search actually is much more efficient because you have to only make logarithmic, logarithmic number of steps. And that is very efficient because if you have, say, I don't know, 10 gigabytes of data and that's all sorted, then you need to do how many steps? 10 gigabytes, which is 32, 35 steps. That will be one. No, not 30, 40. But then it is, right? So that, that's a different number. Right? And essentially, why database is actually working in practice is well, simply because we have indexes. And the indexes are precisely the tool that replaces linear search for a database by a binary search for the index. Right? And so, uh, well, if you have disjunction, that's uh, then all these arguments slightly. Uh, it's like a spoil, but anyway, so. But if you have only conjunctions and extension quantifiers, then it works perfectly fine. Because what usually you have in the queries, you have just a long sequence of, they're called joins. I was told not to mention before, but I suppose in SQL you know about the joins. Well, something like here, well, here it's not expressed precisely as a join, but still it's, it is a join in principle. So 
Here what we do, we uh, select some things from three relations, uh, four relations actually, person, managers, and two copies of the same relation leaves. Leaves, leaves in. And here are just some conditions saying that the name of the person is the same as uh, the name in this in the first copy of leaves and the name of the person is the same as the uh, employee name and manager. And those equalities actually, well, they are kind of like joints. And the point is, well, database, well, database engines, they can execute those joints very efficiently just using kind of nested searching through indices. And that's very efficient. So, right, so let's send test over with some joints there. And that's an example of a select project join. Once again, so what we have here, as I said, we have a number of joints here, right? Well, actually, all of them can be joined. We have a project, because we don't actually take all the things there, we just forget about some of the attributes. And so, uh, select, well, select is a kind of variable. Where is where is the difference between select and join? Uh, theoretical point of view. But once again, uh, quite often here I will not be using this kind of SQL notation, which is lengthy, tedious and so on, but it's very good for programming. But I really prefer this what's called data notation. It's once again you have the head of the query that just gives you all the attributes you're interested in. So that's the project part of it. And then you have some uh, atoms uh, in the body. And uh, those atoms, they are database predators. And Jones there, they are achieved by just using the same variable in different predators and so on. And so here's the same kind of query, the same SQL query as a data. So again, we have this person, name, and uh, whatever that is. Uh, we have this. Uh, that person is managed by someone and that uh, person lives in CTC and that boss he here actually is the manager of that person and that boss lives in C. And literally this query asks you to list actually A is age. So this query asks you to list all the What does it mean? Names of employees who we list all, all the names and edges of employees, right? So that uh, right, all the persons who happen to live in the same city. As they are on boss. Very, very convenient origin. Boss can be believed. Now, <coughs> yeah, once again, the question why don't they create a world? Well, that question has many different answers, but people have been struggling with it quite a lot. So now, uh, well, here we can really, well, there is no flavor if you like. Here's a formal definition. So what we do in theory actually quite a lot, we just say, well, here's a problem. Right? And we, we need to devise a number that solves the problem. Now, and then later on, we can, when we formalize the problem, we can talk about the complexity of the problem. And what actually is convenient is just to consider problems that have Answer side like yes or no. Right. Where have you been on that particular problem? Where you were on the particular day? Uh, were you there or not? Uh, <coughs> so, well, here is the kind of well, formal definition of, of a really interesting so, We have a finite set of atoms, they, and we have a grid, and we have a kind of suspect answer to that grid. And what we're really asking is whether that suspect answer is an answer or not. So either yes or no. 
Uh, now, what is the complexity of conjecture query answer in indicators? Well, there is a way to get, well, suppose that you have a conjecture query, right? And you have a data. Now, how do you check whether that query has that particular answer or not? Well, a very naive algorithm, but what it would do, it would just, well, remember that our conjecture queries that have the extension to quantify variables, or the ones that are taken away by projection. So, how, how do you check whether that query has a well, positive answer or a negative answer? We have some counts to get values for those. Extension quantified variables. And the only kind of, well, what looks like a naive algorithm is just, well, why don't we just list all the possible values and go through all of them? Just one by one. And once you know the values of those extension quantified variables, then all the variables in the grid, they have their own values. And then we can just check whether it's true or not. Well, simply because it's just a conjunction of others. We just go through each of them and say, well, this is the database model. Right? And then if all of them are in the database, well, obviously then there's an answer to them. And if none of them, then, well, if one of them is not, then it's fair. And then you can have to continue to, to the next set of values for the extension. Right? So this was called actually is, uh, well, yes and evaluate. So guess the values for those extension quantified variables. And if your guess is lucky, then you are. If your guess is not, well then, then there is nothing. Else. But then you can so go through all the possible guesses. And then this is what kind of this is what they what is described as this kind of uh, non-deterministic polynomial time, this NP. And so one of the biggest problems of the one of the really biggest scientific challenges now, so if you saw it by the way, there is a million dollars waiting for it. It's probably one of the uh, those, what is it, plain and metal problem, right? Uh, whether B is the same as N, whether the problems that can be solved in non-deterministic polynomial time can be solved in polynomial time in some way or another. So I think nobody really knows. Everyone suspects that it can be the case, but no one has a problem. Uh, now, so this problem is clearly in NP, so just not to guess, Values and check. And well, simply because we can go through all the guesses in a kind of systematic way, then we'll get an answer in the end. Now, <clears throat> the problem with this kind of, uh, with, the, with the naive approach to databases actually then looks like query answer in databases is very common. Because actually, it's not only in MT, actually, it is as hard as any other MT. And to show that, well, there is another thing, well, there, well, there is a kind of standard way of showing that, that something actually is difficult. You just say that, well, I've got here a very difficult problem, and I have what's called a reduction. So what I can do, I can, any instance of that problem, any kind of concrete description of that problem, I can transfer into my own problem. Well, for instance, in this case, we'll start from free probability. So every, you know what? So you have a graph. Right? Graph is a set of edges, a well, set of nodes connected by edges. Right? And then the question is whether that graph can be colored <laughs> using three colors, say red, green, blue. So here's the graph. In such a way that uh, no edge has the same color at both ends. Well, for instance, this graph here is well, it's not free from colorable for one single reason is that, well, you have this triangle here that obviously has to have all the three nodes in different colors. But then there is a fourth node which is connected to all three of them. And we just simply cannot choose a color. So the graph is not three color colors. But the problem with, well, with this kind of the complexity of this problem actually is quite high. It's actually, it is isn't complex. So there is no no one really knows a simple way of saying whether the graph is free color, color or not. Except of, again, just guessing the colors and checking whether actually it's the correct colors. <coughs> well, checking the correct colors, we just check whether each edge has different colors on both ends. That's the way to check. And then what we can do actually, we can just take this simple problem, any kind of instance of free color, color or or any graph, I can call it as a kind of as a query answering problem for databases. 
right? In a very simple way. So what we have here, we have this relation, A, which links all the possible colors or edges. Right? So either one element is red, the other is green, or one is green, the other is blue, and so on. So those are six possible combinations for edges. And now what we do is just write a very simple query. This query says that, look guys, well, here's a graph, right? You can sub edges. So can you map each no, each vertex of that graph. So one of the values, R, G, or B, because those are the only values that appear in that graph, in such a way that each edge in the graph corresponds to one of the six possible combinations. So if the graph is three color color, if this thing represents a three color color graph, then obviously there is such a mapping. So each node can get a value, R, G, or B. That is a color of the graph. If I saw that, so this said that, well, actually, this is strange, right? So this just says, well, database shouldn't actually work at all. They, well, they, well free answer to database actually is and be complete problem. And, well, the, the whole thing about sending complete problems, uh, basically, if someone manages to prove that actually P is the same as P, then all the bugs will, will just have to stop. All the secure communications and so on will just, just really collapse. I mean, that's kind of really some uh, idealistic integration of the uh, statement, but well, this is well, really true. Well, because, well, so, not at all. Basically, most of the security is based on the fact that certain problems are hard to solve. Something like uh, or splitting the number, or, or checking whether the number is a prime number, and so on. It's also a very hard problem. Uh, <clears throat> right. So, now the question is actually why do the database work in practice? I mean, they surely they don't really solve any of the problems. Now, the, kind of the, uh, the trick in this proof is that actually uh, it's a bit of a cheating already, right? Because every time when, when you speak about complexity, what you're actually are speaking about is kind of really a sequence of instances of the problem getting larger and larger. Right? So something like if I, if I draw a graph on, on a page, then well, it might take you some time, and then you'll figure out then whether it's free color palatable or not. But then I make it bigger, well, it becomes more difficult. Then I make it bigger and bigger and bigger. It becomes more and more difficult. Right? And this is where all this kind of NP comes from. Because, well, this kind of NP just really says that, well, you have to, in a way, you have to just enumerate all the possible values. So you just have to go through exponentially many values. And exponentially, well, here means exponentially in the size of the graph. So the, the graph must grow, and then the, kind of the time that, that it takes you to Gets the result actually grows exponentially, and that's well, okay. that's, that's the nature of the right? piece. And here, well, if you look at this kind of, of this particular reduction, then it looks a little bit stupid because, well, you see that kind of the database instance, what was stored in the database, actually, it just keeps. It doesn't change at all, so it just contains all those six rows. That's kind of really tiny database. Right? And that's good. But then the point here is that for this query here, it's not constant, right? So you make the graph bigger, the query gets bigger. You make the graph even bigger, the query gets even bigger. So the problem, but then in practice, well, how often do you write a query that is kind of half page long? Well, perhaps you do sometimes. Kind of a query that takes two pages, well, that will take some. But basically, the point is that in kind of in real life database, well, all the queries are kind of really small and active. And that actually precisely what actually isn't happening. Right? And if you look again more carefully at this kind of naive algorithm that gives us this kind of MP com complete thing. So if you are able to suggest the result, then well it's an MP. But if you just enumerate them one by one, what it takes you can just run it in deterministic time. But the time is kind of is exponential, but only exponential the level of the group. But it's still kind of linear in the size of data. And this, in this example, well, data just stays the same. Right? What grows actually is the size of the grid. And that's actually what, what is called cheating. 
Because it doesn't, well, it doesn't say anything for you. It's just a nice mathematical reduction. Right? Well, now, I suppose we can stop it. Well, because the next one will be in that set of actually, why they actually do what they do. But let's just follow the after the record. So we need a bit. So, well, that was a kind of little attempt to show that the database shouldn't actually work in practice. And now, well, a little good news. So, basically, well, this idea goes back to 1982. Um, well, I'm not sure why he realized that basically that kind of assessment of the complaints wasn't actually fair. And, uh, well, simply because, well, as I said, the queries in database quite often are small, whereas data actually is deep. So, here comes this idea of data complaints. And, uh, well, I think this kind of one of the important ideas, well, kind of, Actually, if you open the, uh, the, the, well, the standard of how to, the description of profiles, then we'll see that term there. So then that's why I actually thought it was important to explain what it actually means. So basically, uh, well, if you remember that kind of definition of, of the problem here, so we have a data and a query at the top, and we decided whether that query has all the parts there or not. Right, and then we kind of in this proof here, or well, this kind of protection here. What we actually did, we just counted both well, the, uh, the data and the query, and, and well, there is no doubt here. Then, so we counted both components as part of the Now, uh, so the observation that actually data data is big and queries are short, leads us to kind of another notion of complexity. This is not complexity. In the usual sense, it's called data complexity. And here we count only the data as part of the input. Right? So that huge query here will not be counted as part of the input. And according to that definition, well, the, as only the data, only the spread of the data is counted. So the, the input always stays the same. And so in a way, this proof doesn't actually tell us much if we uh, fix the query, if we assume the query is short. But then, actually, if we do that, then uh, query answer in a, in a relational database, well, don't forget that we are just talking about here about plain old relational databases that have been around for ages. Uh, query answer today is what was called UPC0. That's actually a well, magic combination. I'm not really going to explain all the details, but basically what it says is that answering queries in database can be done uh, with very high degree of priority. And the idea is that basically, if for each piece of data, or for each individual that, that is in the data, if you just assign a separate processor for that, then any query can be answered in constant terms. And that is that well, if you have this massively parallel computer, then it's all done very good. And that's actually what explains part of why data is. Uh, there is also well, here is a surface of constant depth about the last one this is for those who might know. Uh, then well another kind of interesting thing about this kind of complexity class AC0, that's actually very, very simple, so very few problems actually are there. Uh, it's more of actually it's an even proper subclass of logarithmic space. So you can imagine that logarithmic space requires very little resources to solve the problem. Uh, well then that will let alone of polynomial time. So that's kind of guaranteed to be in polynomial time, so fast enough. It requires very little space, or even less than the very few space. That's very little resources. Now, uh, now we... Well, don't forget about that AC0, it will be right here in a moment. Now we're moving uh, to ontologies, finally. And the kind of the main slogan here is that data is incomplete. That's always the logic. And that's uh, a conference today that is very, very plausible assumption. Here we have what's called open world assumption. And uh, again, well, we have the same picture. Now we try to uh, model this picture not, not in terms of trust methodology, but we just write the yield cost conclusions. Again, we have this, well, now works for is just played by the relational role in terms of description logic. 
object property out. And then uh, we say that the domain of that thing is that this works for top, that's the domain of the logic. Right? So that, that is the set of all the elements that are related to sub under this correlation. That's the domain, the projection. So the first argument. That is a subset of the plane. So that, 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 that. Then the second bit here, in a similar way, to define the range, so it uses this inverse role. So that's the all the second arguments of the relation. That L has to be projects. And then finally, this also concludes very simply just said that every manager is an employee. That's again that's kind of an attempt. So I'll write in the description logic what loss actually is represented there that that entity relationship there. Now suppose that's uh, well the data here is they saw the statement that Nick is a manager, John is also a manager, John works on project A, and Mary works on project B. Right? So some bits and pieces actually are missing. So if you remember the previous part, we had a kind of proper database example where we had Mary was an employee and or there was something else, and then Nick and John were also employees and so on, right? So here we don't actually have those pieces of information. And now if you pause this query. We want to get all the employees. Now, well, the kind of the result that we actually want to get that from the system is uh, John, Nick, and Mary. So they all are employees, right? According to, to this diagram, and according to those constant conclusions. So if you just model this for protege, this is the answer that you will get. No one will be employees for different reasons. For instance, uh, Mary will be an employee because she works for a project. Right? And Nick and John will be employees, well, because they're managers, and all the managers are employees. Right? So those are kind of very simple inferences. Right? You see that? And <coughs> now, uh, if you remember, uh, Description logics, right? So, I think you define the semantics of a knowledge base. What you did, well, you said, that, well, there is an interpretation that is a model, blah, 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 right? right? Remember. So, basically, this just, well, this kind of measure where there is, such as that, well, there are many interpretations. And in fact, if you take this T box and this A box, then there are many interpretations, right? Some of them marry, well, actually, in all of them, there is an employee just because she works for a project and this makes her an employee. But maybe, well, there is an interpretation when Mary is a manager, why not? It's also a perfectly legal interpretation for this T-box and this a -box. It's a model. However, this is well, somewhat strange, right? I'm just assume that Mary is a manager. It's not said anywhere. It doesn't follow from anywhere. Right? So there is a model when Mary is just an employee, not a manager. And well, to deal with this issue of well, having many models, uh, some people come with this idea of what's called certain answers semantics. Right? So what we do here, we just say that well, the tuple is an answer to a query if and only if it is an answer to a query in every interpretation, which is a model of that knowledge base. So take all the models of that knowledge base, and then you have the same query. Right? For instance, here with, with, with Mary, for instance. Mary works for project B, and by this concept conclusion she's an employee. And there is no way she cannot be an employee. Simply because this is a just a logical concept. This will always be true. However, Mary is not a manager, well, because well, again there is an interpretation where Mary is not a manager, Mary is just an employee. It doesn't follow from Mary. And to kind of so illustrate this point, uh, there is a famous example. Which is nearly 20 years old, but still. This is fresh as new. Uh, so, well, what, what we have here will just follow constant conclusions in the T box. Uh, well, just following kind of this E line tradition. I don't really write dot dot here, but that, that's what, what is understood, right? So, mm, uh, well, a friend is a person, right? That's the first constant conclusion. The second concept says that well, every, every person is either male or female, 
Uh, the third concept of conclusions there says that uh, everyone who is followed or followed in the sense of tweeting is a person, and well, males and females are disjoint. Good. So <clears throat> now we have this set of data that uh, Andreas is a friend of John's, uh, Mary is a friend of John's, so John has two friends. Uh, then uh, Mary follows Andrea, uh, Andrea follows Paul, <coughs> Paul is male, Mary is female. Now, <coughs> here we have this query. Does John have a female friend who follows a male on Twitter? Right. Uh, well, here is again this data representation of the query, well, kind of formal, but the one we can tell that it has an answer. Uh, here is kind of graphical representation of these tables. So, right, John has two friends, Andrea and Mary. Mary is a female. Mary follows Andrea, and Andrea follows Paul, who is a male. Now, does John have such a friend? Is that a yes or no? Well, remember that we're dealing with this kind of certain answer symmetry. So we have to consider all the models, all these A box and these T box. Well, kind of the way to approach it is just to well, here's the key. <coughs> well, key is actually this <coughs> this fellow here, Andre. Uh, well, you see, Andre is well a friend of someone. Uh, so this means that Andrea is actually a person, right? According to the first concept conclusion, right? Andrea is a person, and according to the second concept conclusion, Andrea is either a male or female. We don't really quite know, but we may make some guesses. But as a kind of hint, I'll tell you some kind of well, background of the story. So Andrea is just not a kind of coincidence. Well, see, the whole point is that well, in Germany, Andrea is kind of a female name. In Italy, it's a male. So that's the trick. And, well, the example was invented by well, uh, Andrea Sharp. He's actually Andrea, right? <laughs> he's an Italian. Uh, well, he's, he's from Rome, but well, they, they have close connections to kind of well, Balzano, which is in the north of uh, Italy, where they speak German and Italian, and so you never know when you see an Andrea. And, well, you know uh, when, when you see an Andrea. Right? So, well, the whole point is that. Uh, well, according to the second concept of conclusion, in every model of this thing, Andrea is a male or a female. Mm -hmm. right. Well, let's suppose for, for a second that actually Andrea is a male. So Andrea is an Italian. Right. So then John has a male friend. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ah, no, actually, it's, it must be a female friend. Right? So John has a female friend who follows mm -hmm. a male. So, in, in one set of interpretations, well, kind of in a whole bunch of interpretations, Andrea is a male, and Andrea is followed by Mary, who is a female. And Mary is a child friend. And so, in, in those interpretations, in all those models of this T box and this A box, actually, well, the answer is yes. But that's, on, that's only half of the story, right? Because the other half of the story actually that's well, Andrea might be female, might be German. In which case, John follows, well, J John has a friend, a female friend, who follows a male. Right? So, you know, some models have a positive answer, and other models also have a positive answer. So, in the end, the answer is yes, John has such a friend, but the problem is that there is no. I mean, if you ask to give me the name of that friend, you won't be able to find it out. Right? Because in some interpretations, it's actually that friend is Andrea, in others, actually, it's Mary. And you'll learn them. The point is that John has such a friend, but we don't care which one. Right? Well, actually. This just said that oh, we have many models, and we have to consider them all, so give an answer to them. And also, it shows another trick thing that basically every time we have this kind of disjunction, I don't know, he may put in the belly or whatever. But I live in a little bit of a trouble because we all have to consider all the possible models. And that actually makes things very dangerous. 
Um, now, another idea that, well, not only that example comes from Rome, but lots of other things come from Rome. So that's kind of the uh, really rewriting scenario. That's the kind of the key for our Tsukiyo, the whole problem. So the Romans had this kind of really br brilliant idea that basically, when they start modeling global scheme as a kind of ontology, well, Marcus tried to explain it that yesterday, but basically what, what he wants to do, you just uh, uh, want to use all existing database engines because they are very efficient in practice. You still have that ontology on the top, but what you do, you just take, well, query, you take this ontology t -box, and somehow compile them together into a new query. Well, that's a little bit more complicated than just the standard concern query, but anyway. So, you get a new query, and then you make your database engine execute that query. And you just assume that all well, database engines are good enough to be able to deal with those things. That was kind of the core some, some years ago. Right. And, uh, well, here's again the kind of formal stuff. So basically what, what you need to do, you just need to be able to give them any query and the ontology just to compile them together in such a way that on the database alone, on the A box alone, this new query gives the same answers as the query here. And the crucial bit here is that well, on the left hand side here we have proper inference. So here this view is must be true all according to certain answers to my If all the models of this T box and A, that's reason. And that's that's hard in general. That is here on the right hand side. This is just plain old database query of it, and that is easy. They look for relatively easy. That's in AC0 for data complexity, blah, blah, blah. Right? Now, the Romans have this very big question. So this bit is easy. This bit is hard in general. The question they had in mind, for which language, for which ontology language, this can be done in principle? And, well, as a result of this question, they have, they came up with this Profile allows to be That's not surprising. This was supposed to be okay. And <clears throat> then we use this notion of first order right view. So basically, this term comes from you write a query, you told you. You write it down into a single thing and you call it first order query. So, anyway. so <clears> how <throat> to kill, and again, Marcus mentioned that yesterday, well, in principle, how to kill could have contained some other stuff, for instance, for, for instance in the section of concepts. For technical reasons, it doesn't. Uh, all the techniques that I'm going to talk about, they all make it also kind of this extension. Now, uh, well, here's well, a little bit of grammar there for you. Well, definition of how to build, or the official one. And it's slightly simplified, but what you can get, well, can they roll in versus That's the kind of the crucial bit that's how to build has, say, E or doesn't. Uh, then uh, the basic concepts there, kind of bottom left set, right? Concept names and that existential quantifier. Well, I prefer this form rather than exists on top, just to save space in the few keystrokes. And then, well, the T-box ontology can contain, well, concept conclusions, something like B is a subset of B2. Then that bit here, actually, yeah, it's just, just a shortcut. I'm not going to really speak about it. Okay. If it's there. And then, well, this bit here, well, now that this is the journey, and then you can say, well, it's either the same about rows, by the way, right? So the third one is several of our two, and then the journey. And then they both contain just those single statements. Yeah. Uh, the good thing about uh, this language is that it's, as I said, just on the front the right, which means that the very answer is in A0 for the complexity. And in that sense, it just matches perfectly fine. Answering queries in data. Now, there are some systems existing there, and this is Marcus at least yesterday. Uh, well, as you see, there are some, some systems that, that they have been around for quite some time now. They are, well, some of them actually look very good. No? Is it not that? Requiem? Requiem is that. Requiem is uh, it, essentially a part of standard. 
So actor actor re-implemented that thing in, in, in a commercial system. Yes. Yeah, but, but I mean in that kind of university format. Oh yeah, the university not project is not, is not. Yeah, but but well, other systems actually have live patterns uh, kicking. So now the problem kind of from the practical side is that uh, well you see that kind of the whole the whole approach actually hinges on all the following assumptions. So. You take a query, you take an ontology, you produce something, well, a new query, a root, and then you make a database page random. The problem is that, what if this query turns out to be huge? Will the database work? Well, I got that. And that actually turns out to be the case in practice, which was kind of really nice to surprise. And that's, uh, well, in, in all those varieties, uh, what you get as a result well, the size of the right hand, well, it's more or less the same. So basically, it's the length of the ontology to the power of the length of the query, which is very right? And the, the whole point is, uh, it's quite easy to, to make any database engine to, to that. So, <clears throat> you remember that assumption that, well, when my market introduced the notion of a data context, he said that, well, data is huge, queries are small. Right? I mean, with that kind of, with queries of that size, well, queries are not small anymore, and you can't ignore them anymore. So in, in that sense, well, kind of data complexity measure is not reality, really which was quite a nice surprise. And uh, here is uh, kind of an example that just illustrates all the issue. Right? So, and then also, by the way, it illustrates all the very kind of first ideas of producing just all the varieties. And that's again, this, well, if you remember yesterday's example with the cats and canaries, that's more or less the same stuff. But with students and professors. But anyway, so <clears throat> suppose that well, we have this query, that's why well, try to find all the x's that teach some y's and y's have huge sets. Okay. Okay, just an example. Right. So now just to see how this kind of the writing works, just imagine that uh, your t box has this action, and every student has a tutor. So we'll look at this very last option here, has tutor y z, and see that, well, actually, uh, either we have directly those y and z in the database, so they either directly they are listed there in the database, or it may also happen that actually eh, y is a student. Right? In which case, well, obviously, why must have some tutor? Right? Well, this action is just silly. And again, from this, that's in the conclusion. On the mechanical side, basically, you can write this concept conclusion as this kind of data log query, whatever. Right? So this has tutor happens if x1 is a student. And on the, on the mechanical side, what you can do, you can just what was called unify that atom and the head of this query and plug, plug it in essentially. Alright, so what, what we get as a result is that, uh, well, this query has an answer with respect to an ontology containing that action if either that is directly true on the data or this query gives a positive answer. Right? So because if y is a student, as this query requires, then obviously well, every student has a tutor, and that will also be true. Sorry, can you repeat what is the problem? Uh, the, the, the problem is like this. So you have this query, the very, the very first one. Right? Find all x is that they teach some y's and y's tutor z. So that's our given. Right? Now what we're doing, well, what we're trying to do, we just imagine that our ontology contains this constant conclusion chain. And then my claim is the following. So if ontology contains this constant conclusion, then this query has a positive answer. If either this can be answered directly on the data, if, it's, if the data just contains that, Given to you. Or we just know that y is a student. Because if y is a student, then obviously it has a student somewhere. 
We don't actually know the name of the tutor, but the tutor must be there according to this technology. Right? And so therefore, to answer this query, in fact, we have to answer two queries. Well, we have to check whether those two queries have answers from the data. Uh, we can proceed in a kind of similar way. Uh, we here we have this now student here. We can look at this item there in the query. And then if we have another concept conclusion in, in the data saying that well every student is taught by someone. <coughs> or rather no. No. Excuse me. No. It says something different. It says that uh, uh, Everyone who is taught by someone is a student. Right? So, yeah. so this student there actually uh, again I can maybe just directly written in our A books or in the data that why is a student. Or actually it may happen that actually uh, we know that uh, that why is taught by someone. In which case obviously that why must be a student. Again, it's just according to this process. And again, we can just write this in kind of data log, we can unify the most of things, and we'll just substitute this body instead of the, 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 the head. Uh, we get this. Now, uh, the kind of the crucial step there is that now we have two atoms in the query, which share the same predicate, and which can be what's called unified. So unification means that we can Essentially, you just replace the, that x2 by x, and well, the result will be just the same two others. And so we can proceed it kind of in a similar way. And well, the more kind of constant conclusions here, the, the more choices you have. And then, we just well, with those four constant conclusions, we get six possible choices to answer this query. Uh, kind of the difficulty here <coughs> is that uh, uh, the number of those queries, the number of separate queries, it, it grows, well, in fact, exponentially in the, in the size of the t uh, <coughs> Something like uh, if this Plus student has many subclasses, something like well, a PhD student, master student, PhD students, and so on, whatnot. Then what will, what will happen? That for each of those choices, we'll have to produce a different query, well, similar to this one. Because here, well, this PhD student is just one subclass of student, but if you have many, you have to consider all the possible options. And this, well, quite quickly uh, goes out. Control. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, well, you see that well, this can kind of be written, well, can be shown basically. It is, well, this one is negatively exponential. But this one kind of written has a very simple form. It's just a union of conjunctive groups, well, just a list of conjunctive groups. Here we just list all those individual conjunctive queries, and then the result is just the unit of all those. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is uh, can we do something with, uh, uh, with a little bit of extra help from SQL to make those writings short and nice? Okay. Well, because expensive writings are not good for like, database engine. But well, just imagine, uh, well, going back to this, this example, just imagine a well, student has. Uh, well, many subclasses, I don't know, 10 different subclasses. And then, uh, well, teaches, well, that relation teaches to also has well, a number of subclasses. It all kind of really becomes well, quite quickly just take the product of all those subclasses and solve this one. This will look like. Now, uh, can you do a little bit better? Can you just introduce, I don't know, you're familiar with using this uh, Well, here is just a simple example of this kind of maternal grandma. Mother is mother. Right. Uh, well, we can define this using kind of table notation in the following way. So, right. So, 
x is in maternal grandmother y, if x is in z's mother and uh, z in terms is y's mother, right? Uh, so, but then we define mother as a kind of complex expression, but then if we directly just substitute that mother there, then, well, this kind of expression for the maternal grandmother will be longer. And then this way, kind of, well, we use, well, well, this kind of can be regarded as we use, kind of define auxiliary relations, give them names, and then use them in the queries as though they are kind of database relations. Right? So that's the notion. Right? Right? Well, in a way, kind of physical views, they allow you to well, compress the queries. Now the question is, uh, will it really help us if we try to compress well, using this kind of thing? Or, what if we say, consider another kind of variety? So, right? so the problem is that well, the, kind of the basic well, unions of conservative queries, they are exponential variables. So we can't do anything about them. So can we kind of cheat a little bit here, there, and Get away with it. So, well, here's another kind of idea. So, what if we just can see that let's uh, queries that contain, well, apart from select project join, what we usually want, they can they also contain union. I mean, union is a very strong one in the kind of database community because that is a very slow operation. Well, if you take a proper union, then, uh, well, if you have two relations, if you have proper union, well, set theoretical union. What we have to do, we have to remove all the duplicates. And that is a very expensive operation in database. And that's why, again, if you know that, well, SQL has, well, has this keyword union. I'm not sure if I'm, it's very infrequently used. And then there is another one. Can anyone tell me what that is? <laughs> well, there is another one which is called the union all. And that has a very different semantics. It takes the union, but it doesn't use kind of mathematical set theoretic semantics. It just literally takes one list after another. So if John appears, well, if John list, well, if John appears in kind of both arguments, then set theoretic semantics will leave just a single occurrence of John. Yes. But union all will keep two occurrences, and that's why kind of SQL which is not about sets, it's about multi sets and so on. But anyway, so I just suppose I mean this is kind of really all the kind of mathematical is in this. Well, suppose we have kind of SQL with, with union. And actually, well, if you think about it, well, here's just an example. It shows that well, we can, if you have that union, you can express many things in a more compact way. So something like if you define grandparents and you have two relations father and mother, then well, using this junction, you can just use this junction as a pair, right? And well, it's a pair of a pair. Right? But if you try to represent the same stuff we have in the union of conjunctive queries, then, well, you see that you have to essentially to use all the possible combinations, for example, like well, father's father, uh, father's mother, and so on. So, and that, that again, that just shows that, well, actually, units of conjunctive queries, they are kind of inherently exponential, so they always kind of have, if there is a little bit of disjunction. But then, all well, those kind of uh, mathematics, they call positive distinction queries, they are kind of more compact way of representing this thing. Would the same trick work for, uh, for that scenario we deal with? Well, that was the question. Uh, uh, and there was an answer. Uh, an answer well, was given last year. But that was kind of really funny kind of answer. Uh, and the surface is said that, well, it said that, well, everything actually is fine. Well, you can, well, there are polynomial <coughs> non recursive data loads. I mean, this kind of risk code. We use variables for queries. Well, but I don't know which means you find probably so. Right? Oh, well, actually, there are even positive extension variables, so the ones that are even kind of little and simple. Uh, well, the, the problem with, with those variables that, that were presented there is that, well, they were kind of really kind of very exquisite mathematical contraption. So the, the, well, they were kind of they work in theory, they are short and so on. The whole point is that they use kind of some theory things uh, which uh, no one really expects to be uh, uh, dealt by database engines. So, right? 
I'll try to kind of to explain that play a little bit later. That will be scary. Uh, but before that, so I'm just going back to kind of uh, basics of query answer in uh, uh, with ontologies. So the, uh, the thing about uh, uh, certain answer semantics is that uh, that example just with John and Andrea and so on. <laughs> that, that example just showed us that we have to consider all, all kinds of possible models. Uh, the, uh, from the profile of Lauer's OPL was created with, with this idea is that basically you don't actually have to consider all the possible models, you have to consider just one single model. And that model over here is called a canonical model, or people call it the change, or you might call it the minimum carbon model, if you know what that means. That, that's not the point. The whole thing is that, well, instead of considering all the possible choices of models for, for an ontology, where you have to answer the query, it is enough to configure just a single model that will give you all the answers. You can compute it and store it, well, that, that might be expensive. But anyway, there is one thing, so it's quite useful in studying this whole stuff. And well, this was meant to be as an illustration of the point. Um, how the model look, looks like. Uh, well, well, but what is what? Uh, so this gray area here is just, if you like, the tables. This is all the information that is written in the table. So we have those individuals, that small a, c, d, <coughs> blah, 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 right? So we know that well, some of them are related by some relations. Well, that's a graphical way to represent the angles. Is it not? You just call well, have individuals, you just can connect them by some arrows, and that's it. Oh, that's the angle. Now, uh, we also have the, uh, we don't actually have only an ABOS in ontology, we also have a team of terminology. And that terminology, well again, I think well, Marcus tried to explain it yesterday. <coughs> Basically, uh, different profiles of ALT2, they deal with kind of these issues somewhat different. So if you take uh, ARA, ALT2 ARA, that, uh, then that one stays within the ABOS. So everything you can derive, you, I mean, you don't need to consider other individuals. So all the individuals that are there in the inbox, they're there. And the T-box actions, they can't introduce no new individuals, right? It's just not possible. Uh, our tribunal actually is different. And, well, different for, for a reason. And for instance, if you have this kind of possible conclusion, D implies that this T top. Right? So what does it mean? It means that, well, this little guy here, D, small D, it belongs to constant D. And that's, well, and that, that it's, that action, the second action, that constant conclusion, he said that, well, actually, there must be a guy, another guy, which is related by this row T to this D. Is it an A box? <coughs> no, well, there's no, well, the A box contains no such thing, right? And that's why we got to create. We don't really know its name, but it, it is somewhere there. Right? And that's why we create this little point here. Well, we give it some fancy name for technical reasons. But that guy must be somewhere, right? so if this is to satisfy the second action. And kind of in a very similar way, so if you have this kind of A here, it's called A, right? The first action there said that, well, actually, there must be another guy which is related by R. But again, there is no such thing in the A box. You have to create a new individual. And that individual has no name. It doesn't appear in the A box. It's just some anonymous individual. We don't know his name. But we'll give it a name just because it is convenient. And then, well, that guy, in its own term, actually belongs to. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, well, according to the first action, actually, that guy there must belong to constant D, and D, uh, by the second action, must have a T successor there, and by the third action there, we must have a kind of S related element there, at the third action. Yeah. Finally, enough, if you look at again the third action there and look at this element D, that's for that element D, it's so it's already satisfied, right? Because has a Kind of outgoing C error. 
right? We just created that successor. But that actually has a predecessor inside the equals. So the third axiom is not much, but it's satisfied. And the trick with this kind of well, with this canonical model is that well the A box here is just well kind of arbitrary graph. Well that whatever is in the A box is there. So kind of touch and touch because that will be true in everyone. But what happens in kind of all those red modes then then well, they have very specific shape. They are tree shape. And that is why when we create those individuals, we always create them with kind of new fresh individuals. And why is that? Well, a kind of very brief answer is again because of the certain answer semantics. Because if you try to do them together, then we'll get some extra answers that are not there. Uh, I'll try to explain the point somewhat later, but this is kind of the thing. Uh, the other thing is that just related back to kind of well, to that kind of canonical model is that it's not. It's not something new, it's actually, it's been around for quite some time. Uh, well, people just didn't realize that it, it was invented under a different name. Uh, if you look again at delight as a kind of double generated dependency, so you just translate the delight into kind of first order form, right? So, kind of PhD student, which is a subclass of students, right? Kind of first order language you write this way, or like PhD student, like student. But that's a kind of easy double generated dependency. And then, in the same way, you can just translate student as tutor and so on. Now, uh, well, let's just kind of formal definition of what teaching is that. We can just keep that for clarity, I suppose. And that, uh, uh, what was shown uh, a couple of years ago right, is that basically, if you look at kind of DLA as a double generated dependency, that all particular sets of uh, those double generated dependencies actually apply, and they're just only right, and so on. So, in principle, the whole technique actually applies to them as well. But now, with those double generated dependencies, you want this kind of crucial thing, well, I mentioned it, the chains. I mean, it's a very classical database thing, really. It was meant really for relational database, for uh, query optimization in relation to this. Here's an algorithm. I'm not going to explain what the common one is here is. It's just, again, well, just to show that there is some deep paths behind the wall. So, the, well, the procedure actually is quite simple, and that kind of in the way I explained it all before. So, suppose we have this T box. Well, that's the T box. Double generated events, whatever you do. Constant conclusions. We've seen those before. So, those are precisely the same for the constant conclusions that we have before. And now, suppose we have this data that well, Mark is a professor and Andre is a student. Right? What this chase algorithm does actually, it applies those things as though they have trees. So this data. So it just tries to complete this data in such a way that in the end, the end result will satisfy those formulas, those constant conclusions. In such a way that the end result is essentially is a model for this T box and this A box. And that model in some way is kind of minimal, it doesn't contain anything that it actually needs. It is as small as possible. And come to it. Well, first of all, we'll look at Mark. I mean, Mark is a professor, right? And every professor must teach someone. That's this problem here. So, but Mark doesn't teach anyone. What do we do? We just invent someone. Is that not zero? That Z0 actually is someone who is taught by Mark. We don't know his name, we don't really care, it's just someone. Well, in database model, there are nouns. This is very thing which is quite often called nouns from database theory. We just invented it. Now, uh, that Z0 actually, well, simply because it is taught by some. It matches this thing. Then it must be a student. And that's why we have to extend D1 to D2 and add next to five. That Z0 is actually the student. And we can continue on and on. Then that's Z0 because it's a student by the very first constant conclusion, so that was already the answer. It 
must be or must have a table. So well, here we go, we just introduce a new one. The car. That's a few of the day. And we'll continue. Like that. Uh, and then we can continue infantry. Well, the whole point is that in this case, in this particular case, the change is not even final. I will just continue on and on. But then the, the whole point is that, well, this change of the result, the end result, of this kind of infinite, well, if you draw this, that will be just kind of two infinite sequences. One starts from Mark, Mark teaches someone, that someone is a student, student he has a tutor, he has that tutor is a professor, and so on, and just continues on and on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it just continues on and on. It's just kind of a bit of sequence. And pretty simple sequence starts from Andrea. And those two sequences don't end in, in the set. Now, the, the whole point here is that, again, yeah, um, repeated marks. Oh, shake is not here. Uh, the, the whole point is that, uh, in kind of, if you deal only with kind of concept conclusions, that, that, then what you can do, actually, you can do the, those all kind of individuals, then you can do them all together and get the final representation. With query answer, you actually can do it. We'll have some examples if you uh, Now, uh, well, there is another thing about kind of disjointness is that basically, well, disjointness is a very funny thing there. When you construct the chase, you kind of forget about all the kind of disjointness statements. You never use statements B1 is disjoint from B2. And in fact, well, what, what happens is that you can check disjointness later on and throw them to a query. This is something else. Now, this is a very scary problem. Uh, basically, well, this is kind of writing that uh, uh, Georg Gottlieb and Thomas Schlendig uh, proposed. So basically, they said that, well, um, the light and all kind of similar things, well, linear features, whatever they call it, uh, they have this kind of interesting property that basically, if you, if you want, well, if a query has a positive pass, then that's positive function is obtained within a very few steps of the chase. So you don't actually have to continue up to infinity, you can just stop very shortly. And moreover, there is kind of, or bound is more or less uh, known when you have to stop. Now, what, what they say that, well, actually, we can encode the whole thing as a <coughs> query. Right? That looks nice. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, <coughs> well, the query, well, don't worry. Now, the, 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 whole, the whole point is that well, this query essentially expresses this very simple path. Uh, that's, well, if it has a positive function, so if there are a number of steps of the chase that give you that positive function. And, well, this is just presented as an attempt to encode. It just, this little bit here says that, well, there are steps of the, well, there are some, a sequence of methods, and, well, those guys here, well, they just explained that. They just said, well, actually, those guys, they form the steps of the chain. Now, the, kind of, that looks, not only that looks scary by itself, right? Pretty uh, the kind of The very main problem here is that it uses, well, we see that, well, our initial query, it has some variables, well, the kind of constant variables, the values of which we're interested in, but it also has some extensive quantified variables. And if you remember, going back to the kind of relational database stuff, that's uh, the, uh, well, the naive algorithm would run in time exponential in the number of extension quantified variables. Well, here we have those extension quantified variables in our given query. Uh, what we produce instead is a query that contains a lot more extension variables, which makes it much harder. And that's kind of a very unpractical side. On the technical side, if you're interested in that, that basically boils down to also kind of a very long sequence of joints. And well, the length of the sequence actually is uh, something like polynomial in the length of the given group, so it's all pretty nasty. So that's why it's rather unpractical. Uh, now, uh, what actually uh, we did with that kind of well, more of the same time. Uh, we just managed to show that if you try to stick to kind of queries that look more or less like what databases might like, then well, everything is pretty much hopeless. 
So there are no short ratings whatsoever. Exponential blow up is unavoidable for whatever positive is tension, non recursive data, and so on. And basically, it just shows that uh, uh, life actually is much more difficult than everyone really thought it would be. Uh, so I don't think. Yeah. No, well, but uh, here are just some funny uh, results. Basically, those guys, uh, they, well, we've seen it for so kind of first born in 1985, and then what was the whole lot of uh, results. And so, uh, those results actually, they are very non trivial stuff. They, um, uh, the guys actually are trying to solve the P e equals and P problem. And what, what they're trying to, well, they're just given some. Uh, Bounds of the size of certain circuits and formulas represented in Boolean functions and so on. So, if uh, well, basically uh, all the negative results there are particularly striking because uh, uh, they just show how difficult life is. And well, they, they don't think, I mean, they, well, no one actually believes now that they uh, are close to equals one, but no equals one. Anyway. So, uh, that is all fun stuff, uh, but now we're going to kind of so another. So, so what, what we know now that is, if you use kind of really naive array and produce union of conjunctive and that well, basically most of the systems have been doing that. Well, record what was doing that, well, quantum was also doing that. that was a very kind of standard approach in the very first system, and they kind of really well, it was a very funny competition to produce well some sort of rewritings, which was. <coughs> With the kind of side, that is kind of really fun. Uh, uh, but the whole point is that, uh, uh, well, we just so kind of unions of conjunct queries are obviously bad. Then there are short writings which, uh, which no one believes will be uh, doable by databases. But then we kind of show that basically that exponential law is unavoidable. So now, what's next? Well, we need to make systems work. Right? And well, here's kind of really attempt to give you an idea of what can practical writing might be. That's just an attempt. So now, <coughs> we're going to go back, back to more or less the same pictures with the A box and the trees growing out of it and so on. Right? So, we're, we're right. so, yes. uh, so the, uh, the point is like this. So, Suppose you want to answer a query, and well, if you know a priori that uh, basically both arguments of a binary row, if both arguments they appear in the A mode, right, um, kind of life is more or less easy. So what you can do, I mean, if you're talking about kind of proper binary, then what you can do, well, you can write disjunction of or sorry, or all sub rows. So, for instance, A is related by row S to B if and only if it is related by any of its sub rows. Right? Well, because well, if S has sub rows, and you know that's, well, say, sub row R, and if you know that A is R related to B, and R is sub row of S, well, then it's just inevitably that A is S related to B. So, that's the meaning of sub row. And then, well, the dejection said that, well, basically, we consider all these sub rows. And this is fairly easy, right? So that's an easy case, and then we can just encode this as a very simple dejection, and that looks neat. Uh, now, uh, just. Uh, there are some kind of. And, but you wrote that I should tell you that using uh, disjunctions or unions uh, in databases actually is quite dangerous. Well, databases are very slow with all kind of unions and disjunctions and so on. So uh, you can actually hope that those kind of disjunctions will, will work in practice. But then we should there are ways to kind of get around them. Though. And so well, one of those ways is called the, the semantic index. Suppose we have this kind of hierarchy of classes. That one is actually real, that, that, that is taken from the ontology that I'm going to show you in a minute. 
Uh, <coughs> so I'll have a character of classes. And then, for instance, structs so where the, well, suppose that you have a query, list me all the territories, or for instance, list me all the, well, countries in Australia, right? Yeah? So, well, but, okay, well, you can have many subclasses there, so you can take a disjunction. And then I say, well, database don't actually like disjunction. But why would it be the kind of really tricky thing? What if you assign numbers to those classes, or identifiers? in such a way that uh, basically uh, all the subclasses form a kind of contiguous interval. Right? So if you want to get all those from Oceani, then what you, can, what, what you do, you just collect all the numbers from 50 up to 50 points. Right? So well, for instance, Australia by itself will have just 51, but <coughs> those guys here, they will be associated with the whole bunch of the interval. So you can write just kind of very simple arithmetic expression that just saying that well if I give the classes an interval then obviously write just here. And the thing is that for the characters it's always possible to do this. And database is actually quite good with such queries. Well, yeah, because if you have an index and you need to collect everything which has value from 50 to 59, well that's easy. You just go over the index, start from 50, 59, that's it. You don't care. About what themselves. The whole point is that well, this kind of allows you to encode this, what, what otherwise would have been a disjunction over all the subclasses. It just allows you to well, use a little bit of arithmetic and encode this kind of really interval expression. And that together with kind of usual database indexing techniques, I actually, well, to a certain extent, it just solves the problem. Another approach is, uh, again, from the same guys, because they're closely working on they just you know, but this person has to work. Uh, another kind of idea comes from this observation is that well, quite often when you uh, create an ontology on top of the database, what happens is that this ontology to a certain extent it just duplicates all the constraints of the database itself. Uh, something like uh, well if kind of constant conclusion every manager is an employee <coughs> so if you have that then it is very likely that the database will already have those lists synchronized I mean synchronized that will just respect the cause of conclusion yeah. it's very likely that all the database will list all the employee, employees and all the managers and then the list of all the managers will be a subset of all the employees and that's it. it's always the case but it's very likely to but again that just depends on the individual data source and so on. But in that case, actually, it doesn't make sense to consider this disjunction at all. It's just enough to consider employees. Because what the data is, itself, I mean, the data that sort of tables will have already kind of enforced it. And here is kind of what well, the example. They basically <coughs> said that if you define metrics in this funny way, so uh, suppose that well, we have this in the database, you have a single table employee, right? And then all the employees, they extract the data by listing them. And then we also extract this relation to this flow from there as well. Uh, but then, uh, if you define managers, well, so that actually <coughs> also exists only in the global scheme, in, the, in our tables and ontology. But what, well, what if we, again, imagine this, but anyway. So well, what if we just uh, define managers as those employees whose salary is just high enough? And then obviously, I mean, if you look at this kind of, at those two metrics, then obviously all those constant conclusions will be true in the kind of A box anyway. Right? There's no way that it could be possible. Right? So every manager will be an employee because all managers are taken from the same data source. And they literally they, they form a subset. And in the same way, well, every manager manages something and so on, this is all kind of trivial. Right? So this is just a very simple consequence of just looking at those methods and seeing what kind of dependencies exist. And this kind of simple observation just allows us to get rid of that disjunction or union term of database, which is Quite dangerous, eh? 
just turns it into a single button, which is perfectly fine with it. Uh, now, then, <coughs> back to the trees. Uh, so, well, I remember that that was this very simple scenario when basically both arguments of the binary predicate were just felt that, that they were in the agents. Now, what happens if they are not in the agents? But if, for instance, one of the arguments happens to be in the agents, the other one is one of those nuts unnamed objects, the ones we kept to create just by, by using constant conclusion. What happens then? Well, uh, and the story actually is quite complicated then. Well, we've got this notion which we call tree weakness, and basically there are all the ways to kind of fold in the grid, blah, blah, blah. I don't think I'm going into that. But actually, it's all this kind of very interesting mathematical problem, uh, how this all can be arranged, so to get into this uh, so, <clears throat> uh, well, it's just, just a query question. Right, so, well, here's the query. It's the same query on the left-hand side and on, on the right-hand side. And this is the kind of the red block here is uh, an attempt to draw this kind of tree part consi consisting of just anonymous object, apart from the variables. And so what, 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 what we can do, well, there are labels that are S and S minus and so on. And so what we can do in our query, we can take the first atom, uh, map it onto there, onto this anonymous part. We can take the second atom, we can fold it back in this example here, uh, because it's S and the inverse of S, we can fold it. And so all well, this part here can be all mapped into this single edge in that model. And that bit on the left hand side, uh, we always go forwards, so we go here forwards, there forwards, and there. But uh, the point is that uh, there are tricky things there well, related to how to can be with the formulas and so on. Uh, this is just kind of a summary. I just meant to say that, well, basically, if you have a query, then what happens to each individual item? You can either map it into the labels, you can map it either at the beginning of that kind of tree shaped thing, you can map it to kind of in the middle of that tree shaped thing, or you can map it. Uh, far away. The whole point is that if you consider all those possible cases, then what happens is that you end up with this kind of rewrite, which is again does look scary. But, but the problem, well, the kind of the crucial property of it is the following. So essentially, that, well, my claim is that it looks very much like the, the query you had when you started with. So it has precisely the same point five variables, so in a way it's not structurally much more complicated. And then it just lists all the kind of uh, atoms in the query, and for those atoms that can be maps into so the unnamed part of the, of the red blobs there, we have to list all the possible ways. So there is a little bit of dejection there, but the claim is that it's not particularly dangerous. Uh, well, <coughs> I suppose I have a little bit of time to spend on another claim. Uh, that's basically, well, how to kill was created as a kind of big sub language of OWL for uh, dealing with the large volumes of data. Now, the thing is that's actually, well, another part of the story is uh, what, what I have presented before. Actually, it can be done, well, more or less in the same way for EL, which is so surprising. But anyway, it can be done. The problem with EL is that, well, theory says that uh, uh, the <coughs> if you look at query answering in EL, then it is at E time in data. If you remember that for database was this kind of AC0, which was a proper subclass of P time, which actually means, well, this kind of theoretical result means that, well, there is no way you can do query writing in EL. And that is partly true, but then, uh, there was another idea. What if you kind of use two different techniques? You remember this kind of, of this query writing thing? It was, well, Marcus yesterday called this uh, top down language. So because you just plug, essentially, you plug constant groups to the query and extend. 
<coughs> what if you also do the following? What about if you actually run a limited amount of uh, bottom-up procedure, or kind of saturation procedure on the A box on the data? So what if you kind of apply the, the elections to the A box itself? What you can get in there, you can get a new A box which contains just enough information for queries. And uh, the shrink there. And then well, there is, well, if you look at this procedure in this way, so you you read the query, but you also expand the data. And then all this kind of data expansion step, it just eats up all the e time complexity which we which not allow to query right now. And then all well, the orange arrow there on the right can be executed. So, uh, and here is kind of an idea of what actually is going on there. So, well, on the left hand side, we see this kind of game tree shaped thing. This is what happens uh, if you construct a chase in EL. So, if you just apply all the EL axioms one by one, so you just construct a game, it's kind of infinite tree and blah blah blah. Right? But what you, what, what you can do. This is kind of crucial. You can construct a final representation of the file. You can just identify all the points that belong, or roughly they belong to the same constant. Well, more precisely, you can identify, or you just blew up in that tree, all the points that were created for precisely the same reason. It's operated with precisely the same constant conclusion. Right? And then well, you end up with this kind of really small graph here, which just contains two extra points. And so, well, let's clear it. And it turns out that you can rewrite this, well, that's the formal definition of this stuff. But then, what you can do, again, given a conjunctive query and expanded the EPL A box, what you can do, you can just slightly modify the given query. So, well, that file here is the query that we started with. You can add really <coughs> bits and pieces that can ensure that all the answers you get are the correct answers. And uh, the, kind of the very first one says that actually all the answer variables... Uh, <coughs> well, see at this point here, that point comes from the agents, and that's the problem. Those two guys, they are representatives of all the anonymous, unnamed elements that, that were created later on just by applying positive. And what we need to say essentially uh, is that while well, all the answer variables will be variable rates and they all come from the labels, that's one thing. And then we also have well, a couple of situations that can happen well, as a result of doing it all together. And then we can write very simple conditions that just allow us to get rid of those uh, again. Or, uh, Oh, here is a kind of example of what happens there. So, well, suppose you have this simple A box. You have two elements A and B, both belong to concept A, they related by well, uh, that's a simple A box. Well, the concept conclusion here said that, well, if you are an A, then that A has an R successor. So, what you can do, you can just construct this model, this compact canonical model there, so that it comes from the A box itself. And then this point belongs to A, must have an R successor in A, so we just create this B here, and that point B it also must have a point. Well, the source in A must have an R successor which is in A, and that point is again in A, and therefore there is this loop there. And then with this loop there actually represents all those infinite branches. So now, well suppose this, this query. Uh, well, by the way, you can think of this. R S being five and A being an A. Right? Every A has father, which is also an A and so on. And this query here just says that well, if there is an X such that uh, there is a Y, so there is a well, X is father Y and that Y is a father of itself. Well, there is no such thing in the A box. Right? And if you think about it, if you think about that infinite tree, then obviously well, it can happen. If you don't have that particular A box itself, then well, obviously you're in trouble because the rest are kind of problem. 
and they breathe. Okay? So, uh, <clears throat> so these questions have actually negative ones in principle if you look at this A box and this T box. However, this query also has a positive answer <coughs> in this particular squeeze mode, comma, comma, right? Because, well, this A here has a father, there's a father on itself, right? And both on soon. And that is why we have to slightly modify the query just to avoid this. And so one of the conditions there says that, well, actually, well, this is a kind of loop, and loops never occur in kind of a proper canonical model, they never occur outside A. And that's why we say that actually the thing must come, well, X must come from the A box and Y must come from the A box as well. And if you ask this query on this canonical model, on this copper canonical model, that, that will give you a proper answer, basically. There is no such thing. And well, other stuff is kind of similar. Uh, now, the thing is that's actually uh, well, more or less the same idea of combining top bottom and uh, bottom up approaches. It can also be applied to the lab. Uh, you can also, for some reasons, you can also basically, although you can do pure query writing, but then the writing is exponential, that's a problem. Uh, but, well, what if you just combine the, 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 the two steps? So, what if you just expand the data independently? Well, actually, you can do that for pretty much the same stuff with the same kind of query writing. But then the important bit there is, once again, uh, you can produce short query writings. Again, which look pretty much like the, the given query. So, that's this file is again here that we started with. You can have three simple formulas there. And those formulas, which is actually quite important, except that also applies to the L. Those formulas, they produce no new joints in terms of database, so they don't introduce any new distinction variables. What they do, they just filter out some spurious answers, those answers that were kind of introduced as a result of gluing all the points together. And uh, so this writing can be produced, and that one actually is short. But the kind of uh, some minor disappointment, or major disappointment, is that actually uh, this doesn't work with uh, uh, with rolling tools. That kind of short method. And uh, there, is, there was a recent paper which actually claimed that basically they solved this problem just by kind of creating some tricky or defining it. I'm not going to model in a tricky way. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the paper is actually to be presented in Boston. Now, finally, we'll reach that point um, of the lunches pretty soon, right? 15 minutes or so, uh, just to show that, well, there was lots of theory there, uh, but there is still, there is still lot lots to be done. The point is that it's not only theory, actually, there is a little bit of practice behind it. And well, some systems, as, as I said, they've existed for quite some time. The problem with them is uh, well, I suppose they, they were kind of really made in university purpose, so they kind of run without the office standing by your shoulder and giving you all the devices and basically fixing all the uh, bugs on the fly. Uh, so, but this kind of system, well, I believe it's somewhat different, although it's still uh, in its early stages, but we can try to see what happens now. So, <coughs> Uh, what they did, uh, well, you know this, uh, this website, imdb.com, right? The Internet Movie Database. That's, well, well quite an interesting thing, actually, well, you can find their own directors, all the directors, all the films, ever shows, I mean, not only films, TV series, and then the rest of it. Um, and actually, it is quite big. So, if, uh, well, if you... Uh, you can go to the website at db.com and there is this special bit there which is uh, called uh, interfaces from which you can just download, it, download the, the core contents of the, of the database which is about 2 gigabytes of data right, so it's not small one. and so then there are other guys who developed uh, uh, an ontology uh, in Zurich 
the development also that goes together with the data that is not kind of meaning it to, to, to a certain extent. And well, in this demo, I'll just show you what, what happens if you just put the two things together. So well, here we have this uh, uh, IMDb data all just dumped in a bunch of tables. So that, that's just a plain relational database. So there are 21 tables there with lots of columns and so on. For instance, the title has about 11 columns, 11 attributes, and so on. So this kind of relational database, which uh, for the, the numbers is for something like Fifty million examples there in the database, and what for the data set is about ten, one so gigabyte. That's all. So <coughs> that's uh, the database. Then there is, as I said, an ontology, and that one is for a number of concepts and some of those concepts, well if you remember the territory is just presided that the hierarchy contains for the above you do uh, something there. But, oh there is, there is very much there but uh, kind of real difference I suppose with uh, well, Marcus yesterday complained that there are very few uh owls of your ontologists around. I suppose that's just quite simple to see. so that is basically you don't really need a big team to create an analysis of your usually they're quite small. Why do that? we should provide kind of access to, to data sources. And, uh, well, it's kind of very easy to, well, to create them on the fly as you go, if you like, then to create some huge yield like, or well, hardly manageable things, something like Snowman. Um, but as I say, well, this is it's not like the biggest, something like the 30, 50 concepts there. But then the kind of difference with, with the LI suppose is that it has actually quite a lot of object properties. And uh, it has well, some role inclusions there, inverses and so on. So it's kind of well, full blown out of the ontology. It's not particularly big, but it's just perfectly fine for this kind of particular purpose. So, this ontology is so. Now we need to connect our ontology to the data. And we do that with the help of methods. And this, uh, the case, or this, this quest, the quest is actually a plugin for a protege. Right? So you can see no problem. Looks familiar. But uh, this uh, plugin actually introduces, introduces two extra tabs there for the BD model, which just allow us to define kind of general things how how the ontology is related to data. And for instance, here we create uh, the select data source and we connect to it. So there's the URL, there's the username. The initial idea of actually of this demo was to literally to connect to a live database there right in the sun, but then well, they require a connection and so on. That's why I, mean, I wasn't sure about the internet connection, so that's why I had a lot of fun. But anyway, in principle, it could be just it could be run on there, it's no problem. And so it could be it, right? <clears throat> so we connect to the database, and now what we can do, we can just uh, define methods. Mappings that relate concepts and or concepts and roles in our database to so, uh, tables in the relational database there. So well, for instance, what, what, what we have here, kind of a simple thing here, we say that uh, 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 here's an SQL query, you just just a selection from one of the tables there. So I select name, ID from name, asking for blah, blah, blah. And then, well, this database is organized in such a way that basically, uh, well, there is a list of all the persons, and then what you see which role they play, and whether they're an actor or producer or director or whatever. There is another table which is called custom for, and that one provides certain information with some magic numbers. And that is actually precisely what 
kind of integrating da databases for themselves. So it's quite tricky because, well, quite often it's just kind of codes here, codes there, some agreements here, there, and so on. Whereas, kind of with ontology, you can give it all names and use those names and so on. So that's kind of about convenience. In the uh, non expert knowing kind of structure well enough. And what we say here is that, well, this kind of query, it produces that sort of treatment. And well, the first kind of argument here is just constructs a new URI for each shot. And this A is a, I'm sure you recognize it, this term, E is A for type constructors. It just said that, well, this URI is an instance of that class. And for quite an interesting thing about this, again, it's kind of very typical of ontology, is that, uh, well, this Moon ontology, when it was created, they tried to reuse as much possible from all other ontologies. For instance, it uses well, some of the namespace from uh, DBP, it also uses some, some other stuff and so on. Right? So, but it literally, literally said that well, the result of this query, uh, well, all the IDs from there should be uh, made to form RDF triples, or A box statements, if you will. So, this is the way to construct this virtual A box. The whole point is that, well, this A box is never constructed, it's never materialized. All the data is still there in the data. Now, what we can do actually, we can, uh, so these are the metrics that are defined for all the uh, classes and so on, and what here is a kind of field set. Uh, for instance, if we look at the But then uh, what was interesting here is that well, there are metrics for well, actors, actresses, and uh, editors, and well, producers, writers, and so on. But there is no metric for persons. Now the question is why? Well, you simply don't really need it because you can co collect all the information from all the subclasses. Mm -hmm. well, because this is an ontology anyway, right? So there is an ontology for reason. You just, well, you just map some concepts and then the rest of it just being realized. And now, uh, if we go to, to the other tab, which is called a VDA query, then, well, we are not provided you with everything. We are you with the data, we are you with the query, so I don't really have to do anything if I can, so that it all runs smoothly. Let's go. Uh, so, <coughs> here are the queries, and so, well, if you see that the queries are written actually in Spark, Makes it a little bit more and so here what, what we do, we just select all the types uh, such that uh, there is a director whose name is Tarantino and who directed this particular type and so on. Right? So Uh, and we can execute that query and it gives some answers. Right? Um, well, we better insert this team. Okay. Uh, here are all the well, quarantine fields. Uh, you see, it runs pretty quickly. Uh, okay. Well, the query is. Yeah, I guess you might need to say that, that A stands for RDF type. Yeah, yeah, well, I tried to explain it. Yeah, it's kind of, oh my yeah, well, it, it, well, you're familiar with it's part, right? So that is, that's the spot is. Um, and the, the whole point is that, uh, well, you can see that basically, but what happens suddenly is just uh, the ontology and the mappings are analyzed together and the query, well, they all kind of analyzed together. And what is produced in the end is this SQL query. And the database engine just executes that stuff. And again, of the advantage that they display is that, well, it might have ontology and make it so rather elaborate and so on. Well, really, and then the end is rather simple, just by one speed. That's one thing. The other thing, actually, uh, if, if it were a person writing that query, it wouldn't be very much simple. It would be more or less the same stuff, slightly different things and so on. 
But it was that it's all very rational when well, instead of kind of cursor writing those queries, just knowing the structure of the database, knowing all the big details of the little conventions, like three or whatever. Well, matrix number eight then yeah. stands for direct. How would I know? But then in the ontology, it's just all written in language, so you can just read it, understand it, and so on. See and logic are so related to other stuff. Uh, that's one thing. Another thing is that, uh, well, there are some other queries uh, which we can run. This one uh, gives you all the titles that are of genre called action rich. Whatever. I mean, that's, that's the name taken from the ontology. I don't really know what that means. But the point is that when we can execute it, it takes somewhat longer. And I actually suspect it. But it does run in there. And don't forget about this all random on my machine. That, that, that's not a server, that's a personal computer. Right? All runs and it gives you all the fields and blah blah blah. And well, once again, a kind of really funny thing about it all is that uh, well, we start from a relational database, we end up with our DM treatments. So those are uh, actually tight literals, those are your. This one was actually quite interesting. This one uh, selects uh, all the actors right? uh, using this role is up in uh, their names and birthplaces. So it uses well, particular data type properties. Well, this ontology has a number of data type properties, some of the object properties. And so well, here the results are only those who uh, gave their voice to of finding the mean. The fact is, I mean, this is a thing. We can execute it and then it runs again quickly. But the kind of interesting thing about this kind of particular, well, again, this thing might help a little bit, just fills out different parts. But anyway, so that's not the point. The point here, actually, if you look back at, kind of, at the mappings and the, the ontology, then uh, uh, is after being. Uh, has actually no mimics associated with it whatsoever. And how can we get that name answer? Well, the trick here is that actually we know that this actor E is the inverse of has act. And that has two subroles, and each of those subroles has a map. That's how we extract all the information. But then the Clever thing which is happening in the kind of background is that here we again we use this disjunction here, well it's either role ID1 or role ID2, one corresponds to actors, two corresponds to actresses, and this is all kind of done in the background and it doesn't even need to work with all the kind of magic numbers and how they are related and so on. So it is also this is, this is the end of it, so this is the end of the demo, this is the end of the session. Yeah. So you see, I mean, well, despite all the theory saying it's so pretty cold, it's well, kind of an practice. Any questions? Are there any other examples of the examples? Uh, no, I don't know. Well, I don't know really of any other. But, well, you yeah, see, the, it's kind of, kind of, I think it's a problem of the chicken and the the story with the L was more or less straightforward. Actually, the L uh, existed in a way. I don't know whether anyone mentioned it. No? I mean, the story of the L, how it just come about. 
more or less. I mean, so it's very amazing to think that actually Yale existed as such for nearly 50 years in the form of a very thick book, which was published by American physicians, where all those definitions were just written in kind of in English. Right? And then someone observed, well, look, actually, all those are translated, well, can be translated nicely into a very interesting fragment of description. And that was a kind of very interesting discovery that led to a kind of problem research. And well, here we now to feel, as I said, this is kind of a problem of chicken and egg, because well, yeah, it exists long before. Without Sophia, we, well, we can understand it here not so long ago. The idea of what you made later is itself so less than 10 years old. And uh, again, the problem is that there are not so many tools available on the market, I mean, not on the market, I mean, even in kind of university tools that can be used by not particular trained people. I mean, this is one of the examples which can be used. So it doesn't take that long to, to learn a thousand pieces and pieces of work. But all the other kind of folder tools, they are completely unusable. So, uh, why in this kind of way? Station where we don't really have nice scenarios, or well, simply because the tools are not there, yet people are not really, really ready to implement, or rather they, they haven't been implemented very recently to implement them. Other questions? Can I get hmm? Yeah, you can download it. Well, the tool is available. Where? Uh, okay. uh, where, where, where? Uh, I mean, presentation. Oh, <laughs> uh, the presentation? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the presentation will be available. I'll, I'll send it a copy, some copy. And I'll search certainly can solve it for the session. Yeah. All right. That is lunch time.